The third round of the Blancpain Sprint Series sees the teams and drivers make the annual pilgrimage to Zolder in Belgium. Before the action gets underway here, let's look back at the last round at Brands Hatch. It was Lawrence Van Thor and Robin Freins who won the qualifying race, therefore starting on pole for the main race. A great start from Kevin Estret saw him move up into fourth position, trying to attack the Brazilian BMWs in front, with the Nissan trying to go around the outside at Druids. But it was Robin Freins who led the way in the number one WRT Audi. Stefan Ortelli got pushed off. Jules Simkoviak went into a spin at the exit of Druids. He was able to rejoin. Marco Seafried had a trip through the Paddock Hill gravel. The Rinaldi Ferrari recovered, but then had to come into the pits after a problem with the front left. There were great battles throughout the field as Nicky Mermonov tried to force his way past Albert von Turn and Taxis in the 88 Ryder Racing Lamborghini. Mermonov was pushing the limits of the circuit and would later be given a time penalty for running too wide at certain corners. The battle was on for third as Kevin Estra forced his way up the inside past the 77 car of Valdeno Brito to the delight of the Attempto team. The pit stop window was in progress but the 55 McLaren was still pushing hard. Kevin Estra sliding his way through Sterling's. Still leading the race were Laurence Van Thor and Robin Freitz. And a slow pit stop for the Attempto Racing McLaren put them back behind the cars they'd just passed. Jules Simkoviak was feeling brave, making an overtake going up into Sheen Curve. Fantastic move from him. Bernd Schneider was trying to climb his way up the order, having taken over from his AM partner, trying to attack the ISR Audi. Another Audi under pressure was Marcus Vingelhock. Nick Katzberg was trying to get through, but Vingelhock firmly kept the door shut. They went side by side down Pilgrim's Drop, and Nicky Katzberg was able to make the move stick, coming into the right-hander at Hawthorns. He then managed to storm past the MRS GT Nissan too, but it, no one could stop Robins Freitz and Laurence Van Thor, who took victory for the first time in the main race this season. A strong second place for BMW Team Brazil of Attila Abreu and Valdeno Brito with Rob Bell and Kevin Estra completing the podium. But it was victory for Van Thor and Freitz at Brands Hatch. It's the home race for the WRT Belgian Audi Club this weekend and they'll be hoping to perform strongly after winning the race last time out at Brands Hatch. Laurence Van Thor is a local man with a lot of experience of this Zolder circuit and he'll be hoping to win his home race. Yeah, obviously the first weekend in Nogaro we were looking strong as well, but that, it ended up pretty sadly, so we couldn't drive and take any points. Obviously this year our goal is to become champions and that was not the way it should go planned as the first race. But then after Brands Hatch, like you said, it was, uh, it was an awesome weekend and uh, we actually dominated free practice uh, qualifying race one, race two and we as well took the lead of the championship, so now of course it's uh, our mission is not only to defend them, but to extend the lead and then make life a bit easier at the end of the year. Another Belgian in the field looking to succeed is Enzo Eid, after he and Christopher Mies had a tricky weekend at Brands Hatch. I mean, at uh, Brands Hatch, uh, the performance was there. We finished the first race in, in uh, second position, but because of a problem in the pit stop, which, which is a pity, but it's, it's, it's how it is. But um, the performance was there and I think we, will, we can continue here in Zolder, especially with the, it's uh, my home track, it's the home track of the team. It's uh, quite a small track, but it's a nice track, you know, I did a lot of races here, one 24-hour race with the, with the Audi also, back in the time. It's just nice to be here with uh, all the Belgian fans and the people around are very, very cool here, so it's nice. Over at HTP Bentley, Max Buch and Vincent Abril will be hoping to make up for crashing out of Brands Hatch in free practice. Well, meanwhile, there's a newcomer in the 83 car, Jules Simkoviak, joined by GP2 race winner Tom Dillman. I, I don't know the reason, but I got a late... Uh, first time driving the GT3 car in, in dry condition ever for me, so yeah, quite a steep learning curve. There's been a livery change this weekend for the Attempto Racing McLaren squad and a new driver. In the 54 car, along with Philip Vlasic, is Nicola Armindo. But in the 55 car, as ever, it's Rob Bell and Kevin Estra. They had a strong performance at Brands Hatch, picked up a podium finish in the main race. And Kevin Estra is hoping for more this weekend at Zolder, but knows it's not going to be easy. It's a really competitive uh, field and it's, it's tough to know where we are. Especially in after practice because we don't know which tyres everybody use. So uh, it's kind of, at the moment we are not on top, but, uh, but I don't know, I think maybe the other had better tyres. I think the track 
suits us quite good. I like the track, I think it's going to be a good race here. The Rinaldi Ferrari has shown good pace so far this season, but hasn't quite been able to convert it into a good result. Marco Seafried and Norbert Siedler know this Zolder circuit well, and Seafried is hoping this can be their first weekend to shine in the championship so far. We know that we had uh, some, some struggles uh, throughout the last qualifying, like France or uh, Ed Nogaro, but we really found some, some things out on the car which um, helped us, and we think that if we get it to the point, then we could be, could be in the position to be further, at least further up, as we have been in the last two races. The GT Russian team have had a strong season so far. The 70 car of Alexei Karachev and Bernd Schneider has won races in Pro-Am and they'll be hoping to keep up that sort of momentum this weekend here in Zolder. Meanwhile, in the 71 car, Alexei Vasiliev is the pro with the AM Marco Asma. Asma, a former British F3 champion, is looking forward to getting back to racing at Zolder this weekend and is hoping they can have a strong performance in the Pro-Am class. I raced here in 2007, I think it was in a Formula 3, and then uh, we did the same event last year. So uh, I've been here twice. Actually, it's very friendly. Uh, yeah, sure, we all try our best and eventually beat each other, but uh, I mean, we are all, all good friends and uh, it's all very relaxed, I must say. Making a return to Writer Engineering this weekend is Peter Cox, partnering Albert von Turn and Taxis in the 88 Lamborghini. It had been Nick Katzberg partnering Von Turnen Taxis so far this season, but Peter Cox is an experienced racer and has won here at Zolder before and can't wait to get back behind the wheel in the Blancpain Sprint Series. First of all, I'm glad to be back in the Blancpain uh, Series because it's very competitive, obviously. Uh, well, basically, uh, Hans, Hans Reiter, the team owner, called me if I could help him out for this weekend. Actually, it is my home race. I live only 34 minutes from home. It is a good atmosphere, the nice people. It's a, it's a small, tiny track. It's quite technical and uh, yeah, I like to come here. And uh, I've, as you said, I've been here in the beginning and then a long time not. And now the last couple of years I had some more races here, yes. We're all set for the qualifying race here in Zolder, ahead of the third round of the Blancpain Sprint Series of 2015. My name is Jack Nichols. Alongside me in the commentary box is John Watson, and we are very much looking forward to the action that's going to unfold in front of us. On pole position for this race, we've got the number one Belgian Audi Club, Team WRT, Robin Freintz and Laurence Van Thor. It's going to be Van Thor starting the car as we race around this historic Zolder circuit. A fantastic track, a couple of chicanes, some fast corners. It should be some entertaining action. As uh, you can see, the four kilometer long circuit here looping around through the woods just outside of the small town of Hasselt, about 45 minutes from Brussels. And hopefully, as we've had for many, many years that the Blancpain series has been coming here, we should have a very entertaining race ahead of us. As I say, it's Franz and Van Thor on pole position, but it's the Bentley, the 84 Bentley of Vincent Abril and Maximilian Buch alongside them on the front row. You can see them there on the left-hand side. Air temperature, 21.9 degrees. Track temperature is 40 degrees. It's a beautiful day for a race, John. Yeah, I mean, it's a lovely day today. A lot more comfortable than it was on Friday afternoon. 37 Celsius air temperature. Here's a look at the grid. Lawrence Van Thor will be on pole position. Max Buch alongside him. Third will be Norbert Seedler with Stefan Rakelmi alongside him on the second row. Then we've got Rob Bell alongside Marcus Vingelhock. A good lap from Vingelhock to put that Phoenix Audi in sixth place. Out qualifying the number four Audi of Frank Stippler. Then it's Sergio Jimenez. Then we've got Tom Dillman, a newcomer this weekend, alongside Marco Asma. Bernd Schneider will start 11th in front of Craig Dolby in the fast starting Nissan. Peter Cox could only manage 13th after qualifying problems. He starts ahead of Philip Vlasic in 14th. Vardeno Brito there in 15th. 16th for Marco Bonanomi. 17th on the grid at the Fjordback Brothers. And the number two car of Enzo Eid will start from the pits. Through the final corner come the cars ahead of one hour of racing here at Zolder. It's Van Thor on pole position as we get ready for the lights to go out and the qualifying race to get underway here in Belgium. We go green. 
It's a long old hold and now we go and as a result it's not a very good start for the McLaren as they come down towards the first corner. Contact in the middle of the pack and into the wall. I think that's the four car of Frank Stippler spearing off into the gravel trap. The zero BMW has to go off in avoidance as well. It's still Fantor who leads the race. We've got a slow WRT on the outside of the circuit there as well. We'll try and pick out which one that one is in a couple of moments time but not the way we wanted. Oh it's the three car of Stefan Raquelme but not the way we wanted this race to start John. No not so and two WRT cars getting into contact. Something triggered that manoeuvre. We saw Frank Stipper right against the wall coming down the pit straight. He had nowhere to go. There's his car, the number four car. So really, always a problem here at Zolder, the opening lap. You've just got to be a little bit more patient and assume that you're going to get into turn one without making any contact. Van Thorpe, Book, Seedfried, the top three. Then up into fourth place has come uh, a good start from Marcus Winkelhock. He's come from sixth to fourth and then behind him in fifth place. What a great start that is from the GT Russian car of Marco Asma. Oh, and that's the 55 Attempto racing car, the Rob Bell, Kevin Estra. So he must have been involved in all of that. Somehow or other, the McLaren has got involved, puncture to the left front and I think to the left race that car limping its way back hopefully it'll get back into the pits fingers crossed there's the other McLaren that's still out uh, in the hands of the uh, 54 car oh, and there's a spin I think that was uh, Peter Cox going around we come back to Raquel me but there is Peter Cox off in the grass yeah that was an assisted spin Peter Cox got tapped at the rear and around he went to turn 13 out to complete the first lap of uh, frantic racing here at Zolder and it's Laurence Van Thorpe leading the way, but the battle for second place is very much on some debris on the circuit as well. And you can see the tyre marks and they clear away Frank Stippler's car from the gravel on the outside. So we've got the yellow flags down at the first turn. So second is the HDP Bentley of Max Boot. Third is the Rinaldi Ferrari in the hands of Norbert Siedler. And there's Bernd Schneider. He's already up into the top 10 after we've lost three cars down at that uh, first turn. Yeah, I mean, races like this where you get a start line incident, it turns into a punter's race. The big gainer as Marco Az in the second of the two Russian Mercedes-Benz in fifth place as we see the number three Audi back into the pit lane damage there heavy damage to the left front of that car yeah well I think he was well here's a look at the replay actually as they come over the start finish straight they keep an eye on that blue McLaren because it doesn't get a good start Stippler looks to the inside as they come down to with the McLaren and pincers into his teammate Frank Stippler. Yeah, and uh, the whole mechanism of uh, two Audis being taken out, that's where we saw Kevin Estra and the McLaren likewise have sort of left-hand side contact with the Audi, which was against the wall, nowhere else to go. As we view it from the Oof. rearward facing camera, big heavy hit on the Audi and look, out of control, nowhere to go, just spinning across the track, almost taking out one of the, Bra the Brazil BMWs. This is on board with the Walkinshaw and Dolby Nissan. They don't get a very good start. Coming down into turn one, there's the contact happening to our left. Can he avoid it? Oh, yes, just about. That was uh, nicely done from Craig Dolby. Well, you know, if in doubt in the start of this race, stay to the right of the racetrack. It usually means you'll avoid the problem. But of course, a car spinning across like that could take you out. Yeah, and uh, Van Thor managed to hold the lead quite comfortably. There's Stefan Raquelme out of the car, out of the race. What can you do? battle on here as the pit starting number two car of Enzo Ede is up uh, behind the Fjordback car looking to the inside coming down into the chicane and Enzo Ede gets through they weren't able to take part in qualifying uh, because they had a problem with the electrics of the car on board with Sergio Jimenez it's, it's very dusty around there isn't it uh, but it's Jimenez in the zero car he's up behind uh, the sister Bentley the 83 car in the hands of GP2 race winner and former German Formula 3 champion Tom Dillman who got a, a late call up and they're all queued up behind Philip Vlasic in the 54 attempt to McLaren at the moment. Yeah, this is a sort of typical scenario in Zolder where you get one car leading a group of cars, everybody's pace slowed down to that of the lead car. How do you find a way past? Well, you've got to think about it and obviously one opportunity will come down here into turn one but not one of those three cars behind the McLaren really looking as if it can seriously get past. Battle for 10th position this, Philip Vlasic holding it at the moment, he's had three different co-drivers so far this season and he's just lost a place as Tom Dillman finds the inside line and goes through into 10th. Yeah but the McLaren's coming back up the inside trying to find a way past the Bentley but this time the Bentley able to get it done. 
Now the McLaren is under pressure from Sergio Jimenez down the start finish straight. Jimenez looks to the inside line, hasn't got much straight line speed in that BMW, but he's brave on the brakes, and that's job done. And they've all been joined as well by Enzo Eden, the number two WRT Audi. And that was a good move from the Brazilian BMW. Enzo Eden tries the little dummy, he's through as well. Yeah, Vlasnik was certainly caught wrong, footed by the BMW, but he comes back again, cleverly using the undercut to get ahead on Enzo Eden, who did a clean maneuver up the inside, but was slightly wrongly positioned on the exit of turn two, and that allowed the McLaren to get ahead. This is the for second position as they come across the line. Max Buch just in front of the triple three Rinaldi of Norbert Siedler. And uh, there are the Bentley crew getting ready in the pits. Just seven tenths of a second between them. As meanwhile, Tom Dillman, he's the first man to come into the pits. So that's the Bentley crew getting ready for Dillman, who's going to be handing over to Jules Simkoviak, who had a very impressive run in Brands Hatch last time out. So in they come from the battle with the zero car of Sergio Jimenez, who's going to be handing over to Kaka Bueno. You watch us. Dillman stays in the car until the two right side wheels are changed. It's a right hand drive car. In the case of left hand drive cars, the driver change can take a place while the right side tyres are being changed. But in the case of the Bentley right hand drive, they wait a few seconds to let that change be uh, done without interfering with the engineers. Enzo Eid is coming in to take over from Christopher Meese as well in that number two WRT Audi there at the front of the shot. The Brazilian BMW is told to go and comes out in front of the Bentley so that's a good news for the Brazilian BMW squad because they were behind the Bentley when the pit stop window opened and a bit of a slow stop here for WRT because Enzo Eid was up with those two uh, but I think he might have lost a bit of time in the pit stops there and there is uh, the Philip Vlasic car now handed over to his uh, teammate which is uh, Nicolas Armindo so and Tom he's a Dillon, long way yeah, further back. Just been given the congratulations by the team and a good first stint in the Bentley in his first drive for the team HTP. There, getting ready to take over, is Vance on Abril from the second place Bentley, which is in now. In fact, our top three all come in at the same time. So Van Thor in to hand over to Freitz. It's Abril in to hand over to... Uh, sorry, it's Buchan to hand over to Abril. And it's Siedler in to hand over to Seafried. So this Ferrari all weekend has been right on the pace. And this is going to be a battle in the pit lane for, grid, for track position. As we see now, the, the Audi comes up. Out gets Lawrence Van Thor, in get Robin Frey, and so he should be able to contribute if WRT do their job in the pit lane, maintain that lead. So there are the tyre changes going on. The HTP squad, who are pretty good at pit stops. They had a lot of experience last year with the Mercedes. But look at that, the Ferrari's got away and is into second place. Oh, the I, HTP team start to applaud and then go, ah, I, I, maybe I, not. I think there was a, a problem on that car. They didn't quite get one of those wheels, couldn't catch it, didn't get the clear view. But I think there was a problem with one of the wheel changes on the Bentley. That's why the Ferrari's got out ahead. Now, look, trying to find a way past back onto the racetrack they can run at speed here even though it's a very tight turn that needs you back onto the circuit proper and all that means Robin Fries now has a big advantage at the front of the field he is well clear of this battle for second place which now has Marco Seafried and the Rinaldi Ferrari ahead of the 84 Bentley of Vincent Abril and Abril will want to try and take advantage as quickly as possible but that Ferrari is pretty quick in a straight line so it's going to be tough for the big Bentley to try and force his way past as they head down towards the chicane we've seen lots of our red Ferrari when we're back now to the rest of the battling going on with Ben Schneider is the Mercedes and the BMW and it dives up the inside because this is not Bernd Schneider behind otherwise I think that would not have been an easy pass no Alexei Karachev losing out to the Brazilian BMW as they swing through the right hander of two it's Kaka Bueno who's just taken that position and uh, that moves him up inside the top ten now Kaka Bueno the battle for second is calming down a little bit it looks as though Seafried has, has sort of got himself together this car's got two strong drivers we're seeing the performance increase once you've got two guys Marco Seafried Good pass up the inside, but in reality, it was sort of a gift. Yeah, that's Jules Simkoviak going past Alexei Karachev as well. Karachev in the Pro-Am class in that yellow 70 GT Russian Mercedes. A bit of out of shape on the brakes there as he comes down into the left-hander, but uh, the Pro, uh, Bernd Schneider, started the car, and now the Am, Alexei Karachev, has taken over, and as a result is losing places. And Christopher Mies has joined the party as well. Yeah. He's tucked right up behind the uh, 75 uh, 
ISR car of yes. Philippe Salacuada. Yeah, I mean, we've got Christopher Meese all over the back of Philippe Salacuada, but identical cars, the only difference being the individual setups to suit each of the driver pairings. Christopher Meek, potentially the quicker of the two, one side, then back to the other side, trying to frustrate Philippe Salacuada, but not able to do anything with them. And uh, another lap has gone, another minute or more, 21 minutes, just over 21 minutes remaining. Meese still tucked right up behind the sister Audi, but he's got a good drive coming out of the chicane. Outside line for turn seven is going to be ambitious. Meese holds it on around the outside. That'll give him the inside for the chicane. Really good move from Christopher Meese. He takes the place away from the 75 car, and that's ninth position. But he gets a little love tap from Philippe Salacuada for all his efforts. That was a very, very well thought out. Very rare to see a car go around the outside of turn seven, but to get track position for turn eight. He's worked hard for that, grid, uh, that position, and he's earned it. 7.8 seconds the lead up at the front Robin Freitz with the triple three Ferrari in the second position and the Bentley just dropping back a little bit in third spot a shout out to fourth place Nicky Mayer Melnoff who's lapping at a similar pace for the Bentley and the Ferrari in front so he's looking pretty strong this weekend then we've got the 77 car in uh, fifth position which is in the hands of Valdena Brito at the moment and they started 15th on the grid so that's a really good run from them and then it's the 73 car now in the hands of Sean Walkinshaw in sixth spot and not quite running as towards the front as they did last time out at Brands Hatch, but a strong performance nevertheless. And here's a look at the replay of I mean, Meese going around the I outside. Mean, to get alongside and have fighting room, and then to get into position on the brakes, down into turn eight, but he loses the middle sector of the court. is slow here, that's where the tap comes from Philippe Salacuada. He was that little bit quicker. It wasn't anything that was more than just simply I'm continuing my pace and uh, Christopher Mees, he'll take that tap because he's got the position. More pressure on Alexei Karachev. He has got Christopher Mees right up behind him. We've already seen Mees go around the outside of seven before. Doesn't look like it's quite going to work out this time. And if anything, Salacuada is going to attack Christopher Mees coming down into the chicane. Looks to the inside, very late on the brakes, forces his way through, a bit of a bump, but Mees... In that part of the track, there's just so little space. Watch it again as they come down behind Karachev. And, and Philippe Salacuada thinks, well, I'll do to Mies what he did to me. But Christopher Mies, a little bit firmer and a slightly better track position, denying Philippe Salacuada the opportunity to take that position back down into the right-hander. That's a very late look from Christopher Meese, but that forces Karachev wide. That means Meese will get a good drive, and he should be there or thereabouts coming down into the chicane at the final part of the lap. Meese, will he dart to the inside and go later on the brakes than Karachev? Not quite confident enough to do so, which uh, I wasn't really expecting. It's difficult to do it if you're not really alongside the car before you hit the braking zone. Now he's got an opportunity. Again, the power of the Mercedes off the final turn just keeps it ahead of the Audi, but surely now he must look on the inside if he doesn't he'll miss an opportunity well he's done it that's your perfect pass into turn one use the speed off the corner to put himself into position good drive this from Christopher Meese and Philippe Salacuada is going to follow through on Karachev but uh, Karachev still looks like he's going to win the Pro-Am class because they're in front of the Fjordback brothers at the moment next man to attack is Albert von Turnen Taxis in the 88 Writer Engineering Lamborghini taking him a couple of laps to catch up to the back of Karachev. There's Peter Cox who got spun around in the early stages of the race. But now Albert von Turnen Taxis looks to the inside and takes 11th place away. And, and uh, happy hands right Yeah, the rider team are happy with that good clean maneuver by Albert von Turnen Taxis. If you go back on board, Cacabueno catching up to the tail of the distance. The gap between these two cars a few moments ago was probably about four to five seconds. Now it's down to around about a second. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting fight in the final few laps. Caca Bueno right up behind Sean Walkinshaw at the wheel of the Nissan. Look how quickly he's been catching in. Uh, one tenth, three tenths, then half a second on that last lap as they come down towards the chicane once again. Well, this track is really... Oh, oh straight across oh, well, there. He, he just had to turn. If he hadn't done that, he would have probably spun the car. So he took the option, the better of the two options. Didn't gain anything out of it, except that he didn't actually put himself into jeopardy. So. Let's watch again as he turns in, just decides that I've got to do this because it's the only way I can keep the car in control. In the meantime, Caca Bueno thinks, oh, well, he gained an advantage. Why will he not be penalised? Well, I don't think he will get a penalty for that. 
Into the final chicane comes the number one WRT Audi, a double win at Brands Hatch last time out, and now it's going to be victory in the qualifying race for Lawrence Van Thor and Robin Fries. Another commanding victory for the number one car as they win the qualifying race here in Zolder. Comfortably clear of the Rinaldi squad, but look at the delight on the pit wall for them. Absolutely over the moon with that. And uh, third place across the line is going to be Van Sot Abril, but there is a very happy Lawrence Van Thor going over to the pit wall to congratulate the team a really strong performance from him it's not over yet because the zero bmw is attacking going into the final corner right up with the 73 nissan looks to the outside line going to try and go all the way around the outside here caca bueno not quite close enough hits the nissan they both slide and bueno is going to take the place as they come towards the line no the nissan's got the grunt and it's going to hold on to sixth position three across the line together absolutely magnificent stuff as they come through but it's just about the nissan that holds on to take that sixth place and then a good recovery here from the number two uh, audi to take ninth Robin Freins, a thumbs up from him. Robin Freins, congratulations. Thank you. Winning in your own country, how special? Well, uh, tomorrow's a big one. Uh, it's a good start. It's a good feeling to have family here. My dad, my parents, everybody is here to uh, win in front of them. But yeah, the Ferrari is pretty quick, quicker than us at the moment. So we still need to work on tomorrow. That's the main issue. You said the Ferrari is pretty quick. Where do you think it's quicker than you? Um, well, we don't know. We don't know. Uh, I mean, today it was a bit quicker. Um, I asked my engineer to to let me, let know the gap every lap, and it just went like one ten, two tenths every lap. So, yeah, even though I was in a lead by by eight seconds when I came out of the pit, so I was not really pushing like full full power. So, um, well, we will see what we what the car and and us and Lawrence still got in us. Well, you go and enjoy it with your family. Congratulations. Well done. Thank you. Marcus Seyfried, I've just been speaking to Robin Friens, and he reckons your car is quicker than the winning Audi. Yeah, I recognize that we were catching up at the beginning of my sin. I didn't see him, and then all of a sudden he appeared in front of me, which always keeps a driver then biting for and fighting for. But I think it was just tiny steps all the time, uh, so it was not enough to really catch him up. But um, I think, as we have proven at uh, Brands and also at, at Nogaro, we have a good race pace. The only thing what we had to work on was the qualifying. Norbert did a great job this morning, uh, yesterday, and then so we were now in the front of the grid, and that helped us really quite a lot. And the guys did a real marvelous job in the pit because the HGP Bentley we just overtook while pit stopping, so that was the key. Thank you, Marco. Norbert, you had a great start, but the battle with the Bentley really it was won in the pit stop. It was, yeah. Actually, I cannot overtake him. I was a bit faster than, than the Bentley, but I was not able to overtake him. A great job and let's hope for tomorrow and we will be on the podium tomorrow again hopefully look forward to seeing you many thanks thank you Thanks in April you finished third, but really the overtake was in the pitch. You had a sticking wheel, I gather, on the Bentley, and that cost you the position. Yeah, the, the difficulty with the pit stop for us in those kind of tracks where the pit lane is close to our seat, um, it's difficult because we have to wait for the mechanic to do the, the first wheel. So, um, yeah, it's we got jumped in the pit lane, but I think we learned it for tomorrow, and it should be okay. Our pace was good. I was just really managing the gap. So um, I'm happy with uh, with our first podium of the year with Maxi. We had a lot of bad luck and to finally put it on the podium it feels good even though it's only half the jump done but it feels good I know you only expect success Max but I mean under the circumstances on the podium yeah really happy when uh, we arrived to the to the weekend uh, we didn't expect that uh, we did a good job over the night to find something for the race. Uh, I'm pretty happy with the team. They did an amazing job because uh, it's never easy with the pit stop with our car because it's so big. So uh, no blame on them. And I think to, for tomorrow we have a good base. Good man. Well, get up on the podium and enjoy it. Here's a look at the results after 39 laps of racing around the Blanc Pan Sprint Series here at Zolder. Robin Freitz and Lawrence Van Thor taking victory. Five and a half seconds clear of Marco Seafried and Norbert Siedler at the end of the race. Abril and Book with their first podium of the year down in third position.
Head to fifth in the race, Sean Walkinshaw and Craig Dolby in sixth. Completing the points, Philippe Salaquada and Marco Bononomi finishing down in tenth position. And in twelfth place, Alexi Kadachev and Bernd Schneider after what was a very entertaining race here at Zolder. And on the top step of the podium, it's Robin Freitz and Lawrence Van Thor. It's time for the main race here in Zolder. A lovely afternoon and hopefully a lovely one hour of action that we've got coming up for you. My name is Jack Nichols. Alongside me in the commentary box is John Watson. Down in the pits, we have Bruce Jones. And well, he's on the grid at the moment because I think we're in for an entertaining race and we'll be hearing from some of the drivers before the racing gets underway. 24.3 degrees the air temperature, 39.6 degrees the track temperature. A little bit higher than yesterday. Yeah, that's not a huge amount different. The main thing is it's a very tough race, tough race track. 39 laps was the race distance for the qualifying race on Saturday afternoon. Hard on the brakes, 4.01 kilometers around this track, or if imperial measurements, as I would do, 2.49 miles. But it's 16 turns, but three really heavy brakes into chicanes, plus two or three other sections of the track where you're never giving the brakes a chance. So most people this morning that I could see fitted brand new discs, brand new pad to the calipers, and they will need every bit of the caliper and the pad to get through here with brakes. There is a look at the grid on the right-hand side as we look at it is somewhere in that melee, the pole position WRT Audi. It's their home race for the Belgian Audi Club and they've got the homeboy Laurence Van Thor who's going to be in that car. He'll be in second in the car but his bathroom overlooks turn three here at uh, Zolder. And you can see a race between, uh, I think it's the number one car and uh, the Segway going on there. So. That was a nice little shot as he makes his way towards pole position. It'll be Robin Freitz starting the car on pole. And uh, the pressure's going to be on him here because it could all be about the start today. Yes, very much so. It's about the run into turn one. And it's this Ferrari, the green Ferrari, that's going to be the big challenge to Robin Freitz and to turn one. Let's hear from Marco Seafried in that Ferrari. Marco Seafried, the best place to start is on the front row. So you've achieved that. Yesterday we saw a really strong start from the Ferrari. Can you get down to turn one ahead? Uh, that's that's a thing we, we ask ourselves since yesterday if we can make it down there. Um, but anyway, we are we are better than we expected ourselves, so we are not about or thinking about to screw our race down there in the very first corner. If there is a chance, we are going for. Um, but we don't want to mess up it down there in the very first corner. I think we have a good race pace as we have shown yesterday, and if we don't make it there, we try it somewhere else. Well, you're good on the brakes. Best of luck. Thank you. Enjoy the race. Uh, hopefully we will, Marco. Uh, he's, he puts on his balaclava and gets ready to jump in the car. Yeah, I mean, their position, second on the grid, on the right-hand side, not the most advantageous, you might think, but actually, Considering what we saw in the, at the qualifying race on Saturday, all the action took place on the left-hand side of the track going down into Turn 1. And with just clear air and Turn 1 ahead of you, there's every opportunity that the power of the Ferrari might outgun the power of the front row pole-sitting Audi that Robert Friens is behind the wheel of. The last couple of years, the outside driver has managed to take the lead at Turn 1. So that was our second place man. On pole position, though, it's Robin Freitz and Lawrence Van Thor. Lawrence Van Tour, home race. You made a brilliant start yesterday. We're first down to the first corner and stayed ahead. Is Robin as good at the getaway? Yeah, I'm pretty confident. Uh, obviously, it will only be a second start in his GT career, but Brian said she started from Paul and he kept the lead perfectly, so I don't know why he shouldn't be able to do this here. Obviously, the Ferrari, I think, is maybe a bit quicker off the line than us, but uh, we'll fight for it. We'll not give up that easy, so uh, I'm confident he will do well. Well, your car certainly has the right livery for winning here in Belgium, doesn't it? Yeah, that's the goal. A uh, special livery for our home race, uh, and we want to win today. It's very clear, so that's what we try to do. Best of luck. Thank you, Lawrence. Third livery of the season, I think, that for the uh, number one WRT Audi. Yes, this is the, uh, the result of a competition held in Belgium for the ideal race fans. Livery principally is all about Spa 24. Absolutely. So everyone preparing for the one hour race to be getting underway. There's the 88 car. Uh, of uh, Albert von Turnen, Taxis and Peter Cox that's going to be starting in 11th uh, place. Peter Cox having a one-off race in the Blancpain Sprint Series, filling in for Nick Katzberg, but Cox won here a couple of years ago alongside Stefan Rossina. And uh, now we can hear from Marcus Vingelhock. He's going to be starting fourth on the grid. He too is with Bruce. 
Marcus, it's very busy down here on the grid, but yesterday you had a, such a clean race to fourth place. No drama at all by the looks of things. No, the car was great. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't go the speed of the of the front cars. Um, but anyway, um, I think we are in a good shape this weekend. Uh, the Audi feels good. And I think P4 was a, was a really good result. Nicky did a great job as well. And so I think he's also very motivated after the P4 yesterday for, for the today's race. So um, I hope that we can finish on the podium. That must be the target. Well, a good haul of points, I'm sure. Marcus Finkelhock, thank you. Thank you. Actually, in fact, it was, it was Nicky Mayer Melnhoff in his stint uh, after he was handed the car by Marcus Winkelock, who did a really good job. And they ran somewhat anonymously. He didn't see a lot of that number six car, but uh, it was quick towards the end of the race. And OK, now starting in the second row of the grid. You know, once you get through turn one, it's any opportunity for anybody. Enzo Eid in the middle, a popular man. Stefan Rattel on the uh, left hand side. The uh, boss of the SRO Motorsports Group and Enzo Eid, one of the home racers. These, lead, by the way, these are WRT's own grid girls. So Enzo Eid, of course, driving in WRT, is happy to stand beside and uh, along with Stefan Rotel. Uh, Enzo Eid is going to be second in that number two WRT car and he's going to be ninth on the grid with Christopher Meese starting that car. As uh, we look to the grid is starting to be cleared now as they're starting to uh, head off the grid. But we can now hear from Craig Dolby in the MRS GT Nissan. He's going to be second in the car and he's with Bruce. Craig Dolby, the Nissan's looking in good shape. The end of the race, the last corner in the in the qualifying race. Tell us what happened there. Sean did an amazing job to hold on to sixth place. Yeah, I think uh, the racing so close in Blankpan um, in the sprint series, and I think uh, the BMW tried to go for a bit of a move and uh, just caught us and sent us sideways. But Sean did an amazing job to to keep control and uh, keep his calm to the line. So we start in a good position today, and uh, I think race strategy we're in a quite a good place. So we'll see. If we can get round lap one, trouble free, Sean will do a good job as always, and uh, hopefully I can finish it off at the end. Best of luck. Thanks a lot, Craig. I think one of the keys to the outcome of this race is that most of the teams have done everything possible they can to have one brand new set of rubber available for them for the driver change, and that will be, again, a key point as what we might see coming into the pits may alter by the time we get to the end of the event. The twin-turbo V6 engine under the bonnet of the Nissan makes it very, very good off the line. And uh, they'll be hoping to put that to good use from sixth on the grid. You can see it there on the uh, left-hand side. Now on the bottom left of the picture, the 73 car, as the grid is starting to be cleared and this field is going to tear down towards turn one. We did lose one car as a result of the accident yesterday. The number four car of James Nash and Frank Stippler won't be taking the start, unfortunately. Stefan Rakelmi was involved in that start lane incident and he is now talking to Bruce. Stefan Rakelmi yesterday was a disaster for the number three Audi. You didn't even get really past the first corner. How's the car now? Obviously it had to be rebuilt. For sure, it's pretty real. The team uh, made a good, really good job. So now we are motivated to, uh, to recover the, the position because for the championship we, we have to recover a lot of position. It's a pretty what happened uh, yesterday, but it's, uh, it's a race start, it's really close. And uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's too bad also for the number four that uh, they couldn't drive today. But we'll give the maximum to uh, score a lot of points here. Now, it's not easy to overtake here at Zolder. We saw that yesterday, but you should have at least one new set of tyres. I will have for me, but uh, yeah, for sure, as you've seen uh, the race yesterday, it's uh, really close and tough to, to overtake, but I've, uh, I've seen the, the spot where I can do it, so I will push for this, and uh, I'm sure Steph, with uh, all his uh, experience, he will do well. So. We'll watch with interest. Thank you, Stefan. Good luck. Thanks. They'll be starting down in 16th place on the grid. The men who are still second in the championship, uh, Raquel and Ortelli, despite having an 11th and a 7th at Brands Hatch and a retirement in the race yesterday, but there are an awful lot of these WRT Audis out on the grid with their uh, V10 engines producing 560 horsepower, 500 newton meters of torque. They're a mighty little machine and it's going to be uh, two in the top four that we will have on the grid. Yeah, one of the issues that I think Audi are fully aware of and uh, they do the best to compensate for is when the temperatures get higher, it doesn't always help them. They're one of those cars that probably prefer it to be maybe five or six Celsius degrees cooler partly because of the handling, partly because of the tyres, and also, ultimately, it's all about the braking ca capacity. So, a little bit of coast and run into a corner, some drivers might opt to do that, rather than just nail the brakes, particularly at an early stage. 
So here is a look at the grid. Now we're down to row number four with the Brazilian BMW. Lamborghini as well on the right, which is uh, the 88 car started by Albert Von Turn and Taxis. And then here at the back of the field, this is one to watch out for as well. Kevin Estret starting the 55 Ademto Racing McLaren, one of the top uh, drivers in the championship. And that is his view on the rundown towards Turn 1. And his view will be to do the most he can with the available space to get that McLaren ahead of maybe five or six cars which are naturally slower in a lap than the pace that he's got in the McLaren but he's got to be careful because we've seen what can happen on this run down into turn one it's a very narrow in effect you've got concrete on the left concrete on the right and any little error will be punished and in fact the, the uh, Audi caught one of those gaps the, the, the number four Audi as it was punched into the concrete wall caught an access area and it caught the end of one of the concrete barriers that's what did so much damage yeah. to the left front of Frank Stippler's car James Nash wanted to go home but he's giving one of his engineers a lift so he's had to stay there's the 55 car that will start at the back of the grid then Kevin Estra at the wheel but here's a look at their cars as they will line up for this one hour race Robin Freitz will be on pole position Marco Seafried alongside him Vazen Abril third on the grid ahead of Nikit Mayer Melnoff fifth will be Attila Abreu great drive from them yesterday the fast starting Nissan will be sixth on the grid Kaka Bueno and Jules Simkoviak on the next row then we've got uh, Christopher Meese looking to make up more places after they had to start from the pit lane yesterday Albert Von Turnen Taxis 11th watch out for that right to Lamborghini they've got a pace to uh, potentially be on the podium if they can sort it all together. Uh, 15th and 16th will be Nicola Armindo having his first GT start of the year ahead of Stefan Ortelli and Kevin Estra will start at the back of the grid in the newly liveried Attempto Racing McLaren. Yes, the McLaren is now painted in a very fetching sort of combination of aquamarine uh, blue, it's a, but stands out and one of the things that we've noticed for a lot of GT cars where they use white as the base colour you can in a distance difficult to pick out which car is which until they come really into focus but there is the McLaren With Nicolo Armando and Kevin Estra, 54 ahead of the 55. The Kevin Estra car, of course, it ended up in the gravel. It didn't even make it back to the pits after that contact on the run down into turn one. So we've got one hour of racing coming up. A pit stop window between 25 minutes and 35 minutes into the race. Where they have to come in, change all four tyres and change drivers. And after this, we will wait and see who is going to be leading the championship. Uh, there were 39 laps in the qualifying race which was not interrupted by the safety car so fingers crossed we'll be having something similar today there's a nervy looking Norbert Seedler his teammate is in that yellow Rinaldi Ferrari that is second on the grid coming down into the first corner which is a tight little left-hander the cars begin to pick up speed out onto the start straight come the grid ready to get going in this one hour main race here in Zolder when the lights go green it's Robin Freitz on pole position on the right hand side alongside him is the green Ferrari and they get underway and it's not a great start from the Ferrari the Bentley could be looking towards the inside line it is and it hits the Ferrari and off into the gravel trap goes Marco Seafried and Norbert Seedler's Rinaldi machine they were just saying how they didn't want to ruin it at the first corner that's exactly what's happened and that is such disappointment for the Rinaldi squad meanwhile leading the way is Robin Freitz up into second place I think has gone Attila Abreu in the 77 Brazilian BMW battles further back as Nicky Mayer Melnoff makes a pass on Philippe Salaquada now they all charge down the back stretch you're not going to push that one out of the gravel there boys and uh, I think that'll have to be a recovery but Robin Freitz leads the way yeah yellow flag all around the racetrack also Alexei Vasiliev he got tagged as we see the, the Nissan go across Sean Walkinshaw having to bounce across the curb at turn five but Alexei Vasiliev he got squeezed against the wall on the run down into turn one don't know whether that car has had any further damage whether I, it's I think it stopped at turn two according well, to race control I mean all over the place coming through turns eight nine and ten so very messy opening lap opening turn one and all the way around the field this is meant to be yellow flags so I think that's just the yellow flag stage in sector yes. one at the moment. Yep. So uh, the racing can continue over the rest of the pack, but it's Robin Freitz who's got the best start. Only two places made up so far for Kevin Estra. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So uh, Alexei Vasiliev got squeezed into the wall uh, at some point. 
turn, coming down the run into turn. Okay. He hadn't even got to the corner. You could just see out of the corner of his eye. He got pushed against the barrier in very much the same way as we saw for Audi. And up into third place has come Christopher Meese. What a wonderful start from him. He's up into third and uh, trying to take second place away, but he can't with the yellow flags down at the first corner. A little look to the inside from Nicky Mann Melnoff. There's a bit of debris on the circuit there as well as the dust is kicked up on the outside, but I think that's just as they pull the Ferrari out of the gravel trap, but it's Frights, Attila Abreu, Christopher Meese, Vincent Abreu, Caca Bueno, the top five. They all need to be careful because they're not, in my opinion, slowing down sufficiently. The Ferrari has now been dragged out and is back underway, but of course it's a lap down, and having lost that front grid position, it's effectively all over. All they can do if they choose to choose is to continue on their way, but um, I think drivers need to be wary that when they come into that wave yellow flag zone in turn one, slow down more than they're doing. It will be cleared now, but there will be a lot of stones on the circuit. That dust cloud at Turn 1 must have been the Ferrari spinning its wheels to get out of there. So Marco Seyfried is back on his way. The marshal's doing a good job clearing the debris off the pit straight. Uh, but I, don't, I don't know whose debris that is, because that must be from the Mercedes, because the contact with the Ferrari didn't occur until they were actually in the corner itself. So Robin Freins leads the way, 1.1 seconds clear of Attila Abreu, second in the 77 BMW, which has, they've made great progress up the order after qualifying in 15th place, but they've got Christopher Meese right up behind them. Meese, a little dart towards the inside, not close enough. Behind them is Vincent Abril, who lost ground as a result of the contact going on in front of him. As they come out over the line to complete lap two, what's the gap going to be up at the front? It is... 1.8 seconds now, so Christopher Meese knows he needs to get up into second place if he wants the chance to try and close down race leader Robin Freitz. We saw some very creative overtaking. And, and that's Kevin, look, look Estra. Kevin Estra. He's made progress as well. He's now on the tail of uh, Sean Walkinshaw. That's a battle for 10th position. Yep, so he's up into 11th place, having just passed the number three car of uh, Stefan Ortelli, who then repasses him going into turn two. Nice battle there. Meanwhile, uh, Alba von Turnen Taxis has just lost out to Jules Simkoviak. So Jules Simkoviak moves up into sixth place. Von Turnen Taxis drops down to seventh. And into the pits comes the Rinaldi Ferrari. And it's going into the garage, they've decided. Unless they want to just clean out all the gravel in the car, that's going to be at this race over. Disappointing that the Ferrari is out. Let's have a look at that start once again. It wasn't a good start from the Ferrari. Uh, it was a good start from Robin Fries. The Bentley looked at the inside. Uh, the and then... Oh, it's a Bentley catch at the yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it's difficult to say whose fault that was, really. The Bentley couldn't exactly disappear. Maybe uh, the Ferrari should have left more room. This is the rear view from Marco Seyfried. Well, to me, the, the Ferrari had, was on the racing line. The Bentley was on the inside. I think the Bentley should have backed out of it more than it did. It didn't. That was, to me, an unnecessary contact. We don't have any of... So just looking to see 55 must respect. That's Kevin Estra, the strict track limit. So the Bentley caught the back of the Ferrari and that was a little all over. So in my view, that could have been lift off the throttle a little bit earlier in the Bentley to avoid an avoidable contact. Again, while I was watching that, I didn't see what happened to Alexey Vasiliev coming down the uh, start straight. This is the view on board with the zero car of uh, Caca Bueno, who once again had to take evasive action. Yeah, you can see from that angle, clearly the Bentley was more at fault, in my opinion, than uh, the move across the circuit for the Ferrari. And there's Christopher Meese around the outside already, and does he go all the way around the outside of the Bentley? Didn't quite get to see, but... And uh, it looks as though Marco Seyfried has just gone up to complain up at the, uh, up at the Bentley pit wall, and uh, it looks to me as though we might be hearing from him in a couple of moments as they now dive through the chicane. This is the battle for second place still. Attila Abreu in second. It's third place for Christopher Meese, just four tenths of a second behind Abreu up in front. And then the other BMW is dropping back a little bit of Caca Bueno, but now we can hear from Marco Seyfried. Bruce is down there. Let's see what he has to say. Marco Seyfried, we've just seen the replays of what happened at the first corner, and it does look as though you got quite a big hit up the back from the Bentley. Yeah, I did. So yeah, I think it was Avril inside the car, and um, I mean, I just was aside um, Robin, and I felt I couldn't make the move, so I just wanted to get in line. And in that moment, when I just we were just aside, I got the hit from the back. And I think that I didn't do a wrong move or so. I just was there aside and then got that hit, that bang from the rear. And it's really disappointing because first time we are really that strong and we, we wanted to do it safe for, for the race and all that. So it's, it's really disappointing. Yeah. Oh, very bad luck. Sorry to see that. A real shame for the, uh, for the Rinaldi Ferrari squad. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, as Marco Seyfried says, 
you know, I didn't do anything wrong. I stayed on the right-hand side of the track. I was clear of anything around me. I took my line, and uh, I got attacked from the rear by the Bentley. And, of course, the Ferrari, in that unloaded context and the size of the structure of the Bentley, any little tap at all was just going to send the Ferrari into the gravel. So, understandably, upset and had a little word, I gather, I'm just getting word from the pit lane, and he walked past the Bentley pits and I think expressed his feelings, probably in German, but may well have been in English as well. Yes. Uh, 53 minutes to go then here at Zoldet. Uh, Robin Freitz is lapping very quickly, just set the fastest lap of the race previous time around and uh, has now set the fastest first sector. As everyone else starts to queue up behind, here's Nicky Mehmelnov going, using all the curve down there at the chicane. He is in front of Philippe Salacuada. Sean Walkinshaw has dropped down to 10th place now, having started in 6th position. Stefan Otelli's in 11th, and then it's the Fjordbrack brothers in 12th. But there, leading the way quite comfortably at the moment, with about a 2.5, 3 second advantage, is Robin Freitz. And it doesn't look as though, oh, that's Kevin Estra. Well, he was given warnings to restrict, respect track limits. Whether that has led to the car being put back into the garage, he may have just been too wide over the kerbs. There's a lot of kerbs around this racetrack. Unless he got involved with Alexei Vasiliev potentially down at, uh, on the run down towards Turn 1 because we never quite found out exactly what had happened with the GT Russian Mercedes. But that's not a weekend to remember for the Attempto Racing Squad, unlike Brands Hatch where they were podium finishers. I should imagine that Robin Friens is very happy to have Abril in the BMW in second place because that's keeping Christopher Meese's sister team car that little bit further back. Meese was really, really impressive here in the qualifying race on Saturday. It's also keeping Vance on Abril a bit further back as well in fourth position. As there is Robin Freitz learning his way around GT cars and he's got quite a, quite a professor in the shape of Lawrence Van Thorpe who is really driving at the at his peak uh, at the moment, certainly in his career so far, because he was initially learning from Stefan Ortelli when he joined the championship, and then last year he and Rene Rass were in the same team, and it came to blows actually here, where they made contact at the final chicane, and there was a constant inter-team rivalry, but now that Rene has moved on to LMPs, uh, Van Thor is clear to just do what he wants, and what he wants is to win. Yeah, he's Mr. Three-tenths of a second. I think that's the average speed, he's quicker than everybody else within the team on an, on an average basis and uh, very much an impressive racing driver for RD and I just wonder where his future lies, maybe moving upwards into some of the other strata of motorsport, let's say on board with the number 84 Bentley as it comes out of this final turn 15 and 16. He's done the fastest middle sector of anyone that last time through Vance on Abril and is now just seven tenths of a second behind the Christopher Mies Audi in front of him. So we've got BMW, Audi and Bentley all in a three-way squabble over second place. And he took six tenths of a second on that, final, on that previous lap, whereas before he'd been lapping at a, at a similar pace. So maybe things are coming in a little bit now for Vance on Abril. Well, I think what's maybe happening is the pace we're seeing from the second place BMW may be dropping fractionally. I mean, on that last lap, Vance on Abril was half a second or more quicker than the two cars ahead. So he has closed that gap up. And there we now see it, it's virtually you know, three cars running in tandem. Over the crest of seven, down into the chicane. As they come into the right left, let's see how much kerb he takes. Well, I'll tell you, Christopher, Christopher Mies has taken a load of that kerbing. Yeah. And again, that's part of the racetrack where you're going to be looked at very closely. Are you using or abusing the turn nine and that three-way chicane? Kevin Estra has rejoined the circuit in that 55 McLaren, so whatever was the reason that they came in, they have decided to come out. Now it's getting very close for uh, second position as Christopher Mies is going to look to the inside. Not quite close enough, I don't think, but Attila Abreu has to cover it, and Eight. that could give Mies a really good opportunity. Gives him a little bit of a touch coming out of the final corner. The Audi is better in a straight line than the BMW. Whether he's close enough going down into turn one, he is tucked right up behind the Brazilian car. Not quite close enough. But now we can wait, try and make the cutback as he comes out of turn one, tries to get the run to put it. The Audi not close enough again. I thought he might have had a thought about going down into turn two on the low entry into the corner, but wasn't sufficiently close to make it work. So he's now going to wait. Turn four, not really much opportunity. Turn five, the chicane behind the pit lane. That's the next opportunity. But again, he needs to be alongside the BMW to make that pass stick. 
Jules Simkoviak is under investigation for overtaking under yellow flags. That's the man in sixth position who's just set the fastest first sector of anyone in his relentless chase of Caca Bueno. They're going to be the next two cars to come into shot there. And it's the uh, second Bentley that is under investigation for potentially overtaking under yellow flags. Uh, but he's looking quick nevertheless, Jules Simkoviak. The Audi always seems strong in the slower parts of the circuit that's where the BMW struggles coming off slow corners so for example the the hairpins towards the end of the circuit is where the BMW is uh, is challenging to drive and you'll see it here how close the Audi can get both under braking and then on traction out of those slow corners as well that's where the strength is now there's a chance for Christopher Meese he's well positioned coming up to the final two corners can he make a you know, defense obviously by the BMW Audi looks to go all the way around the outside but not close enough again tries to catch the back of the BMW he's knocked out his headlight by the looks of things as they come out onto the start finish straight still absolutely nose to tail though as they come down towards turn one a definitive dart to the inside that makes Attila Abreu cover the inside line is that going to give uh, Christopher Meese an opportunity coming into two oh, not quite all this is allowing the 84 Bentley to be there or thereabouts still well, that's an April. He's just sitting there waiting to make a manoeuvre because if this gets any racier than it is, you can see Enzo Eads face almost the agony of watching what's going on. He knows how close this battle currently is and he's just wondering whether the Bentley behind is going to be the beneficiary as he pulls out to the left. Up the hill, Christopher Meese, not in any position to think about a pass, but again, just harry your competitor, just put him under pressure, make him start driving in the mirror rather than looking forward from the cockpit. Just a tenth of a second between them as they cross the line, you can see there, they are lapping at a very similar pace, as you'd expect, because they're, they're absolutely nose to tail. Again, Christopher Meese taking a lot of dirt on the inside line of uh, that second Villeneuve chicane as we go on board now with Vincent Abril, who's dropped back from these pair just a little bit, maybe just to, to try and cool the car down because the brakes aren't quite as bad as some of the teams feared, but they are still reasonably marginal. And if you're following a car in front, that's what can really hurt you. Yes, and very much the case you might, and Vincent Abril has dropped back a little bit, and uh, that may be necessary just to keep brake temperatures at a, at a sort of a, a livable area whereas Christopher Meese is running as close as he can, pulling out now, in fact, a little bit further back. Again, he's probably suffering the same thing, that when your foot hits the brake pedal, it's feeling spongy and it's feeling long travel. The gap actually almost doubled on the exit of Turn 1 what it has been over the last couple of laps. Cars 3 and 71 are under investigation for an incident together, and that is Alexi Vasiliev and Stefan Otelli. So maybe Otelli was involved with uh, Vasiliev visiting the pit wall. And Enzo, he can't quite uh, contain his nerves at the moment, can he? It's his home race as well. Uh, two Belgian races in the field. He and uh, Laurence Vanthorp, the Vanthorp car, is leading the way. Five seconds clear of this battle for second place, which is being headed by Attila Abreu, the Brazilian in the BMW, ahead of the WRT Audi of Christopher Mies, who is Vincent Abril in fourth spot at the moment in the HTP Bentley. Still, it's just six tenths of a second between Bueno and Simkoviak in the battle over fifth but it's not quite as close as this battle up in front. How are the other two lapping? That last lap, they were four tenths of a second quicker than the squabble in front, and now these two are going to go at it again. So uh, they always give us some good entertainment when they race together. Well, they've got little cr groups of battles all the way through the field, under breaking down into turn 12, and then you've got the sort of flick to the left, and then 14 up. No, it oh. just shows the nose. I mean, Christopher Meese made an amazing overtake coming. Oh, again, contact. Every time, but every he, time gives he, him a but he loses the momentum every time he has the contact. Yeah. And it kind of shoves the BMW that little few paces forward. But now, again, on the rear of the wing, can he move down the inside again? Defended quite aggressively by Abril in the BMW. And Christopher Meese not really making any progress. We're now, what, 15 or so minutes into the race, and nothing he can do to find a way past the Brazilian BMW. Every time he darts to the inside, a brew is, you know, looking at his a, mirrors and yeah. straight away is coming across. Uh, the incident between 84 and 333, which was this man, Vance on Abril, and the 333 Ferrari at Turn 1, no further action. I don't think the Ferrari team will be very happy about that. No, probably It's surprising. Not. I mean, it wasn't intended, but it was avoidable. I think if there had been intent, then it would have been a, an incident, would have been penalised, but it probably was simply viewed as being uh, one of those things at the start of a race. Racing incident. A racing incident, but I would think that the Rinaldi team would feel they were hard done by on that one.
Not that it would have changed anything for them, because they're now, well, they're running around at the back of the field, and, well, in fact, they're back into the pits. Yep, out of the race, the Rinaldi Ferrari squad. But this battle for second place is still pretty relentless on the run down into the right-hander. Attila Abreu holding the position at the moment in second place. They're fourth in the championship, two second places at Brands Hatch and a fifth in the qualifying race here. But now they are going to be under even more attack from Christopher Meese, who darts one way, darts the other at the moment. Abreu, now this time, Christopher Meese didn't smack the back of the BMW. Has that given him more momentum? Out over the start, finish straight. Abreu certainly thinks so. Covers the inside line. Is there still room for an Audi? Yes, there is. Abreu makes sure that there isn't and holds onto the place for the time being, but he's gone in super deep into turn one. That's Meese's opportunity. He's through into second place. Yeah, and that was a thought out maneuver beginning at the edge of the turn six. In fact, between 15 and 16, for the first time, Christopher Meese didn't get close to the back of the BMW. He was able to accelerate that a little bit better off the corner. A big defence into turn one, but of course, the effect was the cutback was the out. He was able to take the tighter line and get the run off turn one and consequently take away turn two. And you, know, you have to think about it. He worked it out, did it cleanly, and that's good motor racing. So he's now got a seven second gap to close into his teammate Robin Freitz, who's leading the way. And Mies will no doubt get on that as soon as possible. You can see how quickly he's disappearing already as they come through turn seven down into the chicane. And now the battle is going to be with Attila Abreu in third and Vatsan Abril in fourth and Kaka Bueno and Jules Simkoviak. So we're going to have a bit of a Brazilian BMW HDB Bentley mashup here. Yeah, Abril basically is sort of holding back uh, now the pace of the third, fourth, fifth place car. So there's going to be two BMWs with two Bentleys. So will the Bentley be able to deal with the BMW better and more quickly than we saw Christopher Meese? Took him a long time, the best part of nearly 15 minutes to get ahead. There the Bentley, Vance and Abril right on the rear of the gearbox or the rear wing of the BMW. Again, clear of the back of the BMW, but not close enough to have a thought about maybe a move on the pitch straight. Is it different trying to attack someone when they are so keen to defend as opposed to if you're chasing someone who just sticks to their racing line the whole time? Does it give you more confidence and think, oh, this guy's so preoccupied by me? Well, I, I like to think that I always had more confidence than the car I was competing with, and therefore I had the upper hand mentally, and I could at times actually manipulate what I wanted them to do to give me some advantage. In much the same way we saw Christopher Meese when he finally got ahead of a reel in the BMW. So let's have a look again and see this pass. Look how close the Audi gets to the back of the BMW. Defence coming from the BMW. Now the Audi cuts back out to the right, takes the later line in, but then he gets the undercut coming through. Turn one's got the momentum, gets ahead. That's It's so simple when you see it done that way, but it took him a time to work out, primarily not to run too close to the back of the BMW. Vance in Abril needs to look at what was done by Christopher Misa Lapago and try and replicate it if he wants to take third place. Christopher Mies has just done his personal best in the first sector. And there is Max Pook getting ready to take over from that third place car, uh, sorry, fourth place car, the 84 HDP Bentley. Mies has now done the fastest middle sector of anyone. And has, so, so far on this lap, he's taken seven tenths of a second out of frights as they uh, come down into the chicane. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were hanging out a pit board there that said BMW, uh, or it said Radio 8, so whether that's a, a different radio channel, maybe they've lost contact with the driver, which is not unusual, and I imagine radio communication is a bit tricky here with all the, with all the trees and the woods. Well, I think it's also very tricky because Abril has got his hands full with just driving the car and doing to get his concentration focused to think, where is that switch for the radio? I've got to put my hand down, I've got to put it into position 8, and uh, that just takes away the concentration, and uh, he needs to be aware, as he probably is very well aware, that Vance and Abril is only waiting for any opportunity possible to pounce and put the BMW down into fourth and the Bentley up into third. Now that uh, Attila Abreu doesn't have the Audi all up in his grill behind him, it, uh, it looks like he's able to sort of concentrate on going forward and as a result has got away from Vance and Abril a little bit as they come over the crest of Turn seven, uh, still von Turner and Taxis in front of uh, Mayor Melnhoff, and that gap has gone up to 1.2 seconds. As they swing through the right hand there, we've got a red flag coming up on the screen. Well, that's something very... And now it's gone green, green. again. So, uh, well, we had a red flag, actually, on, on uh, Saturday morning, 
where the car, it actually was Christopher Meese's car, did stop on the track, and the red flag was thrown, and then of course Christopher Meese's car got back underway, and it was then had to be withdrawn. So we did see a red flag momentarily, which is um, unusual. Well, let's but put it uh, that way. Yes. Yeah. Probably a bit of leave a, it there. I think as well. Yeah, timing glitch or something like that, because it popped up on our timing screens and then popped up on the graphics and then disappeared again but anyway we're still under green flag conditions here in Zolda the gap at the front is down to seven seconds now the battle for third place though is still very much on Christopher Meese has set the fastest lap of the race though uh, but more importantly he's under lap 13 mm. I mean that car has been run all just well just about a third of the distance that this race took yesterday but of course the cars will be coming into the pitch from anywhere within the three minutes Pit lane will be open in three minutes. Whether Christopher Meese decides, not Christopher Meese, whether um, Robert Freens decides to come in early and hand over to Lawrence Van Thor, who has a brand new set of tyres available to him, or whether they keep him out. He's in clear air right now. He can run under his own pace. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, but car number two has just been given a drive-through penalty. Christopher Meese has worked so hard to get up into second place and given us some great entertainment along the way but now he's been given a drive-through penalty for jumping the start there you can see confirmation up at the top of the screens so that means that uh, Attila Abreu will still be in that third place and well we thought he got a good getaway because um, he managed to go from ninth on the grid to something like third at the second corner but uh, yeah, drive-through penalty for Christopher Meese. I would take it immediately, get it over and done with, and then you're going to come back in probably to the pit lane and do your driver change handover. He's staying out. Yeah. Well, so uh, he'll probably stay out for as long as possible, do his drive-through penalty one lap, and then come in to change driver next lap because he is the, the quicker of, of, oh, of both very, and very much so. But um, just obviously the timing, he was just at the pit lane entry probably too soon to uh, make it all work for the WRT ID team. So let's have a look at the uh, jump start. The right hand side of the queue, uh, the uh, black and yellow WRT Audi. Yes. Darts to the inside line. Yeah, well also one of the... It's, it's, uh, it's a tight one, isn't it? It wasn't, it wasn't blatantly obvious. That's probably why it's taken the stewards such a long time to, to come to their conclusion, some 25 minutes into the race. I think one of the ISR Audis may well have been on the move before the lights went out as well but obviously Christopher Meese slightly further up the field more under the observation of the race stewards that was caught and of course at the penalty and it's an expensive penalty is a trip down the pit lane and the loss of track position the loss of a podium position which is probably very much on the cards for this number two car before the penalty was issued and uh, the consequent loss of points too yeah the top 10 are covered by 21 and a half seconds so you have to say that Christopher Meeks will probably be dropped out of the point scoring positions when he does come in to serve his drive through penalty which is clearly a real shame for he and Enzo Eid uh, they are down in fifth place in the championship and a strong result here would have he's put coming them, in now yeah would have put them back on track for sort of championship contention but uh, okay so it, it wasn't necessarily jumping the start is because he moved out of line yeah uh, which which so they consider jumping the start yeah, yeah. as well a jump start is a catch-all description yeah and they can apply whatever they feel was a benefit or an advantage which was unfair because it put him into a position where he had no car directly in front of him and therefore he could accelerate that a little bit more progressively or aggressively in the case um, consequently he got up to third place on the opening lap and so he says <laughs> well, what does that make is that, is, that a, <laughs> a is, that, is, that, is that a Belgian hand signal to your teammate yeah. I, can't, I, don't, I can't tell if that was sympathy sorry about that or what were you doing you're meant to be the you're meant to be the quick guy so he well, comes he is out the quick guy <laughs> he, he is uh, a little bit too quick at the start he comes out in front of uh, Alexei Karachev so he's down in 13th position now and it's going to be a, a long 35 minutes now for that number two WRT. Yeah, but interestingly, Enzo Eid is standing there without his overalls done up and without the helmet on, so he isn't anticipating his teammate coming in within the early part of this pit stop window. So, what they're probably going to do is keep Christopher Meese in that car until just before the 25 minute uh, comes up, and therefore the pit lane will close. Look at that advantage that Robin Franks has now that the pit stop window has opened. It's 10 and a half seconds over Attila Abreu in second place then third for the uh, HTP Bentley but they're all coming into the pits so a brew comes in uh, also in comes the Bentley and this could be 
interesting because they're going to be going on to a fresh set of tyres, whereas these guys are going to be on the older set, so perhaps a, a chance of an undercut. Well, there's going to be a fresh set of tyres going on to the Nissan. Well, Sean Walker, I'm sure he brings that car into the pit lane. Greg Dolby will be taking over the wheel. So everybody, well, half the front of the group of cars coming in, taking advantage. Max Book opens the door. Vance Avril gets out. In the case of the BMW left-hand drive, it's easier for the driver change to be done. Uh, quickly round to the left-hand side of the car, so the driver change oh, look at that brake impeding. Dust. Yeah, there's a lot of brake dust. I mean, it's such a difficult circuit here on just keeping the brakes, not just cooling them, but keeping them from wearing out. So out rolling. Goes, yep, and let's see where the Brazilian BMW is in comparison. It's going to be tight. The door's still not shut, and they're having trouble strapping him in, so that's a really bad news for the 77 car. And they're going to lose out to the 84 Bentley, so that's a change for position. Ultimately, over second place, the 84 Bentley of Max Book out in front of the 77 Brazilian BMW. And uh, the 6 Phoenix Audi is now comfortably clear of the 88 Lamborghini 2. Uh, so that's uh, good news for uh, Marcus Winkelhock, who's now at the wheel. Not good news for Peter Cox, who's lost out positions. There's Renault Dufour, the race engineer at HTP, having a chat with uh, Vance on Abril. But good news for the 84 car then. They're up into second position at the moment. So Cacabueno leads the race, comes across start finish line. Well, France is still out there. France hasn't Indeed, he is. So he's so far ahead. Yeah, <laughs> you forget about it. Well, he's 14, se almost 15 seconds coming across the line. There is uh, the number three Audi of Stefan Ortelli that hasn't made up that much progress, not as much as uh, we were expecting. It's 24 seconds, so he's going to be making a late pit stop, Stefan Ortelli, because the pit stop window where they'd come out in isn't quite uh, clear enough at the moment so this is ultimately the battle over second place at the moment we'll see what happens with Jules Simkoviak and uh, the other Brazilian BMW of Caca Bueno who are here and they are well they're up behind the uh, Alexei Karachev Mercedes so we'll see how quickly Karachev gets out of the way whether these two get held up at all well, at the moment, be... they're in fourth and fifth yeah uh, ultimately Hopefully the Mercedes, well, the blue flag is being waved at the Mercedes. We did see yesterday the Mercedes had good pace, but not a good lap time. So it was quite difficult to find a way around it. And Cacabuena will not want to have the attentions of the Bentley behind him because that's going to be an opportunity if he gets trapped. As the lead car now is into the pit lane, Robin Friens comes in to hand over to Lawrence Van Four and a brand new set of Pirelli rubber. On board with Robin Friens as he pits from the race lead. To hand over to his teammate Lawrence Van Thorpe, also in come Bueno and Simkoviak. To hand over to Sergio Jimenez and Tom Dillman, respectively. Unplugging his radio there up at the top, sticks it back on his helmet. Yeah, you're not allowed to undo your seatbelts until you come to a stop, but what you can do is loosen the shoulder straps by manoeuvring your shoulders around so that when you undo it, the straps themselves are at a length where when Lawrence Van Thor wants to get in, he doesn't have to adjust them to then to reattach them to the six buckle. So, in they come, and there is the 83 Bentley as Tom Dillman, former German Formula 3 champion, gets in the car. Uh, Valdeno Brito has just done the fastest middle sector of anyone. Now he's at the wheel of the 77 Brazilian BMW. He's looking uh, very fired up. Away goes Laurence Van Thorp, still comfortably in the lead of the race. Now, this is going to be the second and third place car, but the battle really is going to be fourth and fifth. And where they come out in respect to that, it's a good stop from the Brazilian squad. And so they're still comfortably clear of the 83 Bentley. Now, are they going to... No, nah, I don't think they're no. going to be quite be but in the, the mix there. But the, the, the second of the Bentley, Bentley coming down the pit lane, it may be slightly challenged because it's not close enough to the tail of the... So the two BMWs come out effectively, one behind the other. But Now, who's going to come out here? Is it going to be Marcus Vingelhock? I think it is. Vingelhock comes out ahead of Tom Dillman in the 83 Bentley. So that's a position gained for the number six Phoenix Racing... Uh, Audi and as a result they are up into uh, fifth position so joy in the Bentley pits as they get back at number three still there's an Enzo Weed behind the wheel or is it Christopher Meese still Christopher Meese showing now in sixth position but until all the pit stops are fully flushed through as we go back to Maximilian Book uh, Meese has still got to have his 
driver change. He served his drive-through penalty, uh, but he's still got to come in and hand over to Enzo Eid. Max Buch has just done the fastest first sector of anyone, but he's going to be well behind the race leader. It would be quite a turnaround for Buch to close in some 15 seconds to Lawrence Van Thor in front of him. Uh, the 88 car of Peter Cox has lost out, I think, to Marco Bononomi in the 75 ISR Audi. But here's our race leader across the line, Lawrence Van Thor, who retakes the lead of the race now. Uh, no, he doesn't. He's still in second because Christopher Mead hasn't come into the pits yet. So, But he will ultimately be our race leader. And now we've got this battle between Max Buk and Valdeno Brito. That's the battle over second and third. Fourth place is uh, the Sergio Jimenez BMW. Fifth place is Marcus Vingelock in that Phoenix Audi. Sixth position is Tom Dillman. Up into seventh place is the number three WRT Audi. And there you can see uh, a thumbs up from Jules Simkoviak. Yeah, and it's hot work out there. I mean, these cars are a real handful. Hard work, really get very little time for the driver to catch his breath and rest before you're into another corner or a big braking zone. And of course, there are so many of those around this four kilometer Zolder circuit. So this is the battle over, I think, what will ultimately be ninth position, uh, eighth position, actually, because the Fuelback brothers are in the pits too. There's Enzo Eid waiting to take over from Christopher Mies, who will soon come in from uh, what at the moment is the lead of the race. As the cars bounce through the chicane, up over the crest of the hill at turn seven with 27 minutes to go. Pit stop window shuts in two minutes time, but Max Buch is pushing really hard at the moment just yeah. to try and get the gap to uh, Valdeno Brito behind him. Just keeping an eye on Peter Cox running behind Marco Bonanomi in the Audi number 75. Peter Cox really very good around this is home track really he lives 30 minutes up the road over the the Dutch border and his daughter uh, Stephanie Cox was racing in uh, in a BMW at Zandvoort earlier on today qualified third was leading the race in the early stages and now she's driven over here to watch her dad race don't know where she finished yet I'll, uh, I'll ask Peter after the race as they wind through the final chicane so Christopher Meese is in and that means Van Thor resumes the lead of the race Albert Von Turnen taxis with a not too delighted look because he doesn't love battling over what is going to be uh, eighth position and so Eid makes his way down to the pit lane Bernd Schneider's just on the fastest middle sector of the race so far but he's down in 14th position after uh, Alexei Karachev took the car in the opening stint this is not going to be an easy battle for Peter Cox Marco Bononomi will know how to use the Audi to its full strength as we see Enzo Eid get back onto track through turn two 26 minutes remaining here at Zolder and this is the battle over well, so, so the, the Nissan has lost out in the pit stops again the MRS GT squad not uh, that used to well, they've raced, they've raced before, and, uh, in, and with the McLaren at, uh, in the Blancpain Endurance Series. Yeah, but in, in the case of the Nissan this weekend, one of their key personnel was engaged at another event, so um, a lot of his skill or experience is being missed, and uh, you know, pit stops are crucial. You can lose a second on the racetrack, and you might fight it back, but to lose four or five seconds in the pit lane, it's really, really tough. So Greg Dolby, even with the new set of Pirelli tyres, finding himself down in 11th place battling with Peter Cox who's got his own battle going ahead with uh, Marco Bonanomi. Our race leader is Lawrence Van Thor who has just set the fastest lap of the race on lap 22 and that's the gap back to second place which is Maximilian Buch in the 84 HTP Bentley third is Valdeno Brito so it looks like it's a third and fourth at the moment for the BMW Team Brazil squad which is a, a decent effort from them uh, fifth place is Marcus Finkelhock still comfortably clear of Jules Simkoviak and it's still that Bononomi Cox Dolby battle over 8th, 9th and 10th that's the closest battle on the circuit at the moment but if Van Thor and Freitz can hold on to take this victory it's going to be four in a row and it means they will have won every race that they've started so far this season. Indeed and sadly they didn't start the first round in Nagaro on Easter weekend because there was a, an incident and the car got damaged and consequently they um, had to sit and watch the event out but Ever since, they've just dominated. Through the chicane comes the Phoenix Audi. And then this is the squabble going on here, although Peter Cox has dropped back a little bit from Bononomi. Really frustrated earlier on Peter Cox because he wanted to do this one-off race for Hans Reiter, get a really good result. And 
and kind of prove how good he is essentially before no. handing the car back to Nick Katzberg for the remainder of the season. Well, and Peter Cox, I don't think, needs to prove how good he is, people know, but they did have problems, particularly or trying to they struggle somehow to get air out of the brake system, both of the ABS and uh, the actual brakes, the calipers themselves. So you're, you're never confident when you put your foot in the brake if you think there may be something, so you're always just hesitant to commit. Uh, as you might need to do to make an overtake, particularly here in Zolder. Greg Dolby thinking, well, maybe I've got an opportunity to bring my Nissan up into it. He's in 10th place now, running directly behind Peter Cox. He'd like to get a little bit further up, get a couple more points, if possible. Philip Vlasic is just at the fastest middle sector of anyone in the 54 McLaren. And there he is. He's got Bernd Schneider right up behind him. And... Uh, so I don't know if uh, maybe he's just because he's got Schneider right behind him he's pushing harder or whether he's skipped across at one of the chicanes or something like that I don't know and the McLaren has shown really strong pace at times through the weekend and Flash even in the qualifying race was certainly doing a strong job defending his position and lots of more competitive cars find it difficult to get past but uh, in the meantime fastest first sector personal best in the fastest second sector personal best in the third so, of course, all the way down in 13th position, but nevertheless, he's trying. Bouncing through the chicanes there goes uh, Bernd Schneider. Fastest middle sector of anyone now, set by Stefan Rakelny, who's running in seventh place. Uh, two seconds behind Tom Dillman in front of him. We're on board with the 73 car again of Craig Dolby. In this queue over eighth position, Bononomi, Cox and Dolby separated by 1.4 seconds through the final chicane and out onto the start finish straight once more 22 minutes to go here at Zolder and it looks as though Lawrence Van Thor and Robin Freins are well I mean it doesn't look as though they're commanding this race they are commanding this race they've really just taken the advantage into turn one all help no doubt by the contact between the Bentley and the Ferrari which took the principal challenger in my opinion to Audi here this afternoon the number 333 Ferrari that was so strong in the qualifying race and Audi were concerned the pace of that Ferrari was sufficient that they didn't think it was going to be an easy easy path to take victory but once that car was taken out in turn one that was very much more a case of just bring the car home and the same can be said too of uh the Bentley as well because Lawrence Van Thorpe leading the way Max Book in second the last lap for Van Thorpe was a tenth of a second slower than Max Book and even their best laps are just two tenths of a second apart so the Bentley has the pace as well but it just hasn't worked out for either the Bentley or the Ferrari uh, in the race today and it, once again it's Van Thorpe and Freins who have who have bossed it yeah and they just capitalized on the pole position a clean start Robin Freins did a good job did what he was request, required to do then another stunning pit stop from the WRT team and Lawrence Van Thor behind the wheel, it just extends the gap but he's in a position now, all he has to do is drive and it's almost as if it's a Sunday afternoon drive or a drive in the sun in Zolder, whichever way you prefer to put it. That ISR team is under investigation, uh, Philippe Salacuada there watching his teammate on the pit wall but that uh, 75 ISR Audi that's in 8th position is under investigation for uh, its pit stop and we can always rely on Albert to, to pull a little face for us, but he's looking now to get him into eighth place if that, if anything befalls the 75 car. Flashing lights from uh, Philip Vlasic as he now closes in on uh, Anders Fjord back in 12th position. Well, that ought to fairly straightforward overtake the pace of the McLaren. That's shown to be very strong, certainly seeing some purple sector times. Oh, oh and, and off Enzo Eid. And I think that's on the exit of two. Uh, yes, it is and I can't, I can't really figure out how he's got into that position. Well, I don't think he was challenging anybody. We didn't see him close to anybody. He'd only just rejoined the track, having had the car handed to him by Christopher Mies. No, he had a big gap. He had seven seconds in front of him and eight seconds behind him. Well, either that's something that just down to a cockpit trouble, maybe riding along in the crest of a slump, as a friend of mine once used to say. <laughs> but anyway, into the gravel and disappointment for that number two, RD. So... Uh, we, we didn't manage to capture that, so uh, we don't know how he's ended up in the gravel there. An unusual one. Uh, the 75 Audi is under investigation because uh, 
there's a belief that the, me the mechanics weren't back behind the working line when the car was released. All the me mechanics have to be pit side of the car behind a white line before they're allowed to release the car for, for safety reasons. And that's why the 75 is under investigation as they turn into turn one. Once again, now up to the yellow flag zone. This battle between Fjordback, Vlasic and Schneider continues. Just wondering, car number two says spun into the gravel trap at turn three. Car number two, please check transponder position. I wonder, I just wonder, is it something as simple as Enzo Eid was just checking that the transponder had been changed from Christopher Meese to himself, that he just took his eye off yeah. the ball? Quite possibly. 18 and a half minutes to go. There's Bernd Schneider in 13th place, still leading the Pro-Am class and destined to win the Pro-Am class because Alexei Vasiliev has crashed. I still don't think these three cars slow down enough going through that flag zone. You can see that the marshals are on the outside of the corner with Enzo Eid's car waiting for a snatch vehicle to come and pull it to safety. Stefan Rakelmi in the number three WRT Audi has been gradually cruising up to the back of Tom Dillman in front in sixth position who in turn is less than a second from Marcus Vingelhock in uh, fifth as the recovery continues. And uh, there's Christopher Meese who, after all his hard work, got a drive-through penalty for jumping the start and then has seen his car spun into the gravel trap. Down into the hairpin once again. Interesting to watch the wise old head of Ben Schneider and the yellow Mercedes-Benz watching that battle continuing ahead of him thinking where can I wait or do I have to wait I've got just 17 minutes or so of the race remaining to try and get my car from 13th I'd like to take 10th place that's occupied by the third car of this group of three coming into turn two Craig Dolby and uh, now the number two Audi has been recovered so the yellow flags are out but won't be there for very much longer 17 minutes remaining as the 74 car of Anders Fjord back comes through turn one again Philip Vlasic pushing hard into turn two can the McLaren 650S find a way through that Attempto racing machine that ran so strong, strongly in the hands of Rob Bell and Kevin Estra last time at Brands would have run strongly here but a first lap incident yesterday and I presume a first lap incident today because they came straight into the pits after, uh, after lap two yeah, Bernd Schneider just showing the, the yellow nose of the Mercedes coming up the hill into turn five just to keep the McLaren honest it's focused very much on the back of Marco Bononomi in the number 75 Audi down through turn seven into turn eight hard on the brakes careful not to use too much on the inside of the curb Bononomi has been warned about track limits earlier in this race the gap at the front is 13.4 seconds and on that last lap, the, uh, the first two drivers did exactly the same lap time. 1 minute 31.583. That is, that's evenly matched, I'd say. Yeah, not much give and take no. there, was there? Uh, but the gap is 13.4 seconds. Then it's three seconds back to Valdeno Brito in third. Uh, fourth place is Sergio Jimenez still. And this battle really is still the closest one on the circuit. As they come down over the line once again to the left-hander. Philip Vlasic, that was uh, Nicholas Amindu we just saw in the pits, and there's Enzo Eid recovering now. And there's damage to the, to, the, yes, to the right front now. Was that contact with another car? We didn't see the cause of Enzo Eid going off, but there's damage on the right front, which would indicate to me somehow or other that was contact with another car that then caused him to spin into the gravel. And uh, hopefully, well, if he gets back to the pit lane, we might find out, or whether he wants to continue, but he's dropped all the way down to 14th in effect, now last in this race, 15 minutes of it remaining. Into the chicane and Schneider's really pushing hard, throwing that GT Russian Mercedes over the kerbs, then dropping down through the left-hand sweeper of seven. Into eight. No, oh, goodness me, using a lot of the kerb there, the 74 car of Fjord back. Yeah, you, you, you've got to really be... Um mindful of the fact that if you do take too much particularly that's the one part of the track Schneider looks to Mark on the inside can he get it alongside enough he's almost at the point is there going to be he just manages to avoid the contact I thought he was just going to release the brakes and let the Mercedes roll down to be squarely alongside the McLaren into turn 12 but he shot the better of it it's Alexei Karachev watching on in the pits 
as they come into the chicane. Uh, in the 54 car is Philip Vlasic. Across the line and uh, Anders Fjordback darted back towards the outside line very, very quickly on the run to turn one. That's an ambitious move from Vlasic. Not quite close enough. And Bernd Schneider is going to try and say thank you very much and get through. Not quite able to. Tries the inside line into two. Not close enough. But uh, I thought there was going to be a bit of a touch there for a moment because Vlasic was reasonably committed to that one. He certainly was, and Ben Schneider was thinking, what are these two guys doing? <laughs> they have no idea I'm behind them, and I'm not prepared to commit myself because they're on predict end to eat into the pits. And uh, the team have said that he has uh, spun on his own. I don't know whether the damage, maybe the damage came earlier, but there was damage to the right front oh, that, of the well, car. That was Christopher Meese ramming that BMW all throughout the first stint up at the chicane. Could well be. he kept touching him, probably. 13 minutes to go, and this is the battle over 11th position. Anders Fjord back in the ISR Audi, ahead of Philip Vlasic in the attempt at racing McLaren, and then Bernd Schneider behind in the 70 GT Russian Mercedes SLS. You can see Fjord back has been slower than Vlasic on these last few laps. Meanwhile, Peter Cox is still trying to take eighth place away from Marco Bononomi. Yeah, they've been sort of battling like this for the best part of, well, since the driver changes, which would have been, what, 15 or so minutes now ago. So Peter Cox not really able to do anything. And uh, maybe the Brazilians have won pit stop challenge again, because again. as ever, they're over the moon. Well, they're certainly enjoying the sunshine on the pit wall, so I'm assuming it's something more important like winning the pit stop in our challenge. Now, astonishingly, on that last lap, Lawrence Van Thor did a 1 minute 31.295. Maximilian Book did a 1 minute 31.291. So last lap they did exactly the same lap time. This lap time they were separated by four thousandths of a second. So they'd make great synchronised swimmers or <laughs> divers, wouldn't they? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they would. Uh, as they... As they uh, there's a thought. Down into the chicane. Once again comes this battle that no one can really make any movement with. Although Vlasic has got a pretty good run through the chicane, might fancy a lunge going down into the next right-hander. Not quite close enough, and Fjordback covers the inside line. Yeah, he covered Look that. Look how much Kirby takes yeah, on the left-hander. But he did left cover it pretty well. He just made no room for the McLaren if it was thinking about it. If, that, if, he, if the McLaren had persisted, there would have been contact for sure. Again, Ben Schneider sitting behind, watching this battle. He had an opportunity to go past the McLaren into this turn 12. Thought the better of it a lap ago and uh, not in any position to think about doing anything up the slight incline that runs up to turns 15 and 16. Marco Asmir looking on the pit wall, wondering what's going on with the sister car. As far as Schneider is concerned, to a certain extent, he's leading the Pro-Am class and is, and is reasonably happy to stay there, but he wants to make up as many positions as possible naturally as they all thunder across the line. That Mercedes just sounds wonderful going into the first corner. And he's got a good run through there, Schneider. Not going to be close enough to challenge Vlasic into two, though. And Anders Fjordback is holding on to that 11th spot at the moment. Second in the Silver Cup. It's Tom Dillman who's leading the Silver Cup, along with Jules Zimkowiak in sixth position. And this, meanwhile, is Peter Cox trying to pass Marco Bononomi for eighth place still. So let's battle them again. Peter Cox harrowing Bononomi all the way through. Not able to do anything. The gap has sort of been pretty much constant. Peter Cox not able to use the local knowledge. And uh, well, look at that, Ben Schneider really chucking the Mercedes into turn five and six as they come up over the hill, drop down into the compression into turn eight. You can fjord back, use it very cleverly, puts the ID in the bit of racetrack that, that the McLaren would like to take, but not doing anything that's considered unsporting. No, absolutely not. Less than 10 minutes to go now, and this is the battle over sixth position. And it is Tom Dillman in sixth place in the HTP Bentley, and he's been reeled in by Stefan Raquelmi. And again, they're both now lapping virtually identical times. That's this, the situation you end up. You catch the car, but it's so difficult. If you can't make that momentum carry you through at the point you get close enough, then you're just going to be stalled out at the speed of the car you're chasing. This is really what's been going on in this battle all the way down for uh, what, 11th, 12th and 13th. And as Fjord back said, his personal best final sector that last time around. That's why he's got a little bit more breathing space. Another pit...
they're running in fourth place at the moment, so that would be a shame if that got taken away from them. But we'll wait and see whether they have broken any rules in the pit stop window. Eight minutes and 50 seconds to go here in Zolder. As they come down towards the chicane, a little look to the inside from Schneider, not close enough. After this, we go to the GT Russian home race in Moscow. Around the streets outside uh, the university. As they come into the uh, left-hander of the chicane and McKelmy is right back with Dillman again. Yeah, the pit stop for car zero under investigation. and No wonder the Brazilian team were cheering at the point. Uh, they thought they'd got the uh, prize for the best pit stop, but maybe that was just... A again, legal one. Well, there may have been some, again, just not everybody back behind the, the requisite line uh, before the car leaves the pit lane. Peter Cox desperate to try and make his way past Marco Bononomi and up into eighth position. But still, he just can't quite get close enough to the ISR Audi in front of him, a feeling that Philip Vlasic knows very well. And if anything, Vlasic now is having to look in his mirrors because uh, Anders Fjordback is starting to pull away. He was three tenths of a second quicker on that last lap. And as a result, the gap is up to a second between Fjordback in 11th and the McLaren of Philip Vlasic. As they come through the right-hander of uh, turn two, seven and a half minutes to go. Just wondering the gap opening up between the idea and the McLaren for this battle all the way down for 11th place. And I wouldn't be surprised if Lajek is running out of brakes. He's been really running so close to the back of Fjord Bax, Ardi. And so that may be the reason why the car is falling back as race leader Lawrence Van Thor comes across start line to complete lap 34. 39 laps for the qualifying race on Saturday. So I suspect with the time remaining, we're going to see probably 38 to 39 laps. Uh, being the distance again. The team manager of the Rinaldi Racing Ferrari has been asked to go and see the stewards at the end of the race as well. So uh, a lot of work for the stewards today. I wonder what he's done wrong then, other than maybe remonstrate with the Bentley yeah. team. So can the WRT Audi now find a way plus Tom Dillman for sixth position? That's going to be the big story in the closing stages. It's still an 11.6 second advantage that Fanthor has in the WRT Audi leading the race over Max Book in second place in the HDP Bentley. But this is closed in again as Peter Cox continues to do his absolute best to pass Marco Bononomi. Out onto the start, finish straight. Comes this continuing squabble for 11th place. Well, the gap looks like it's slightly closer than it was a lap ago between the McLaren and the Audi. So maybe just simply backing off momentarily to give yourself a chance to catch your breath and then make one final surge just six minutes to go before the checkered flag comes out. But, I mean, it's a battle ultimately for a level place which is outside the points. Yes, yes it is. And uh, Anders Fjordback is second in the Silver Cup, so he can't uh, gain anything because he's just in 11th place. Uh, nothing to gain for Vlasic either, and nor for Schneider. So they'll want to finish as high of the order as they can, but ultimately... Ooh. Did bodywork just come off the number one car or did he run over it? Well, I think, I think there's it. Some, uh, it may have been a bit of bodywork on the track from someone else, but certainly looked like Lawrence Van Thorpe might have just flicked it as he came down the pit straight. Yeah, there it is. As they come down into turn one, the two Brazilian BMWs have... Oh, it's quite a big bit of bodywork, but it's now almost up against the pit wall, so hopefully it's not... Oh, there's going to getting just the... I think now it's sufficiently close to the pit wall, it's not going to be a problem. No. Five minutes to go here in the Blancpain Sprint Series main race from Zolder as they uh, come through the left-hander. Five minutes to go, and this is the battle over 11th place that we've been watching for some time now, but still, Anders Fjordback is holding onto that position, but Philip Vlasic has now closed in rapidly. The three cars pretty much equidistant as they flash underneath the commentary box window, and down towards turn one once again. Oh, Schneider running nice and wide outside turn one. John Watts has made his way down to the uh, Park Firm 8 to speak to our race winners, which should be this pair. Uh, Lawrence Van Thor and Robin Freitz. Another commanding victory. This is what their lead looks like. That's what 11.2 seconds looks like. Uh, back to Maximilian Buch running in second place. And then the two BMWs have closed in on each other a little bit. Jimenez closing in on Valdeno Brito. 
and in terms of the championship, uh, Brito and Abreu are higher up the order than Bueno and Jimenez. They've got 11 more points, so I imagine that the Team Brazil will leave the uh, cars in that order. Uh, the pit stop for car zero has been deemed to be OK. So no further action for uh, or against the zero car. Still Peter Cox, no, not close enough. In that battle for eighth place, then it's ninth, uh, sorry, tenth for Craig Dolby. That Nissan hasn't quite had the, the pace they would have wanted. And then in this eleventh place, battle comes out again and that's very very wide from Anders Fjord back that's the opportunity that Philip Vlasic has been waiting for and through goes Vlasic he takes the place away and now Bernd Schneider will want to follow through as quickly as possible Vlasic goes in deep into turn one that allows Fjord back back to the outside line Bernd Schneider's watching this and is trying to take advantage nose up the inside not quite close enough Vlasic holds onto the place for the time being less than three minutes to go and Philip Vlasic has finally managed to take 11th place away from Anders Fjord back. Now, how quickly can Bert Schneider follow through? Coming down the back stretch, down towards the chicane. Not close enough this time around. But he could get a good run out of the corner here. I know he's dropped back quite a lot, actually, so that didn't work out for him. But look how quickly Vlasic has disappeared on up the road. to the right-hander. Turn 8, 9, 10. Then out through 11. Goodness me. He's just disappeared, hasn't he? Uh, Philip Vlasic now up into 11th place. This is uh, Stefan Raquelmi still trying to put Tom Dillman under pressure. The battle for 6th position. They're two and a half seconds back from Marcus Vingelhock. Less than two minutes to go. The BMWs have closed in on one another. They're going to be celebrating another podium. We're on board with Sergio Jimenez. Over the crest of the hill. Down through seven again towards the Villeneuve chicane. A minute and a half to go, so we're on the penultimate lap of the race. We're going to have the same amount of laps as yesterday by the looks of things. We're on lap 38 of what will be 39. Jimenez has shown good pace to close in on Valdeno Brito in front of him, but it's a fairly comfortable position that the BMWs are in now. Final lap started by Lawrence Van Thorp as he comes across the line and down into the first corner. His home race hasn't had the success here in the past that he would have wanted to have won the qualifying race here last year but wasn't able to take victory in the main race the year before that he was nose to tail with Stefan Rossina across the line and it was only second place for him there but it looks like he's finally going to take victory in his home race into the left into the right and now over the crest On the brakes, into the Villeneuve chicane. What a commanding performance this has been from Freitz and Van Thor. They crashed out in qualifying in the opening race in Nagaro. So as a result, they couldn't take part in the whole weekend. But since they have returned in Brands Hatch, they've had pole and two wins. And it looks like they're going to have pole and two wins here. The 24-year-old Belgian comes down towards the final corner for the final time a really strong performance from Robin Freitz and Laurence Van Thor pole, two wins in Brands Hatch pole, two wins in Zolder it's victory for Van Thor and Freitz they extend their lead at the top of the championship Max Buch comes across the line to finish second for him and Vance on Abril. It's third and fourth across the line for the two Brazilian BMWs. Good performance from them. Fifth spot for the Phoenix Audi of Marcus Vingelock. Sixth and winning Silver Cup is Tom Dillman. And there is the 88 Reiter Engineering Lamborghini of Peter Cox. 
He crosses the line in eighth position. Uh, sorry, ninth position behind Marco Bononomi in eighth. And completing the top ten is Craig Dolby in the Nissan. And Philip Vlasic will hold on to that 11th place. 12th is going to be under Sjord back by the looks of things. And uh, it looks like the front of the bonnet is coming up just a little bit on Bernd Schneider's car. Not too much to, to make a difference though as he comes across the line. And it's going to be 13th place for Bernd Schneider. A win in Pro-Am for he and Alexei Karachev. And uh, there is uh, Vance on Abril. They seem pretty satisfied with their work here. It was sixth in the main race in the 2012 FIA GT1 World Championship for Van Thor. He was then second in 2013 behind Stefan Rossina. Last year here in Zolder they had a third place, but finally Van Thor wins at his home race here in Blancpain. Literally his home race. He lives overlooking turn three. When he's brushing his teeth in the morning, he can see the circuit. And now finally he's taken victory. And Bruce Jones, who's joined me up here in the commentary box, it was a, it was a commanding one. Uh, exemplary from start to finish. Their biggest worry was the Ferrari, and that, that worry was removed at the first corner. And uh, we've all seen the replays. It was quite a thump up the rear. And uh, I guess it's a learning step for Vincent Abril there. I'm sure Marco Seyfried will, will have calmed down a bit now, but he will be wanting words. But uh, whether anybody could have got close enough to the number one Audi, I mean, it's been looking in absolutely fine form, but I think the only people who could have really taken the challenge were Marco Seyfried and Norbert Siedler. And unfortunately, we'll never know if they could have done it. Hopefully, they'll have uh, the pace in Russia next time out, uh, which will be uh, a, a great race, fingers crossed, around the uh, streets of Moscow. As the cars filter their way now back into the pit lane and down towards Parc Ferme, Van Thor quite a way back in the queue as he's been celebrating all the way around and all the marshals giving the local man a round of applause. And he's yet to make it back into the pit lane. Here he is, coming into the pit lane now. And uh, as I say, that extends their lead at the top of the championship. Uh, I think from Valdeno Britta and Attila Abreu, who will have leapfrogged Raquel Minortelli up into second place in the standings. Uh, there is the 77 car, a third place finish for those two. And uh, smiles. But Vald Valdeno Britta's got plenty to say as he, as he climbs out of the car there. But there is our race winner, Robin Freintz and Lawrence Van Thorpe. Four wins in their four races so far this season. That sort of dominance we haven't really seen in the Blancpain Sprint Series. And Van Thor climbs out of the car, having taken victory in Zolder. And <laughs> he's at that point where there's no more delight about taking a win. It's just a, yep, I'm pretty good. I won. Yep. We've we won, of course, it's well, the, yes, the, yes, the yes. team event, but he's just been so on top of everything since they turned up at Brands Hatch. Obviously, that mishap at Nagaro, they didn't get out to play, but since then, they have been the gold standard. And uh, now they expect it every time. It's up to the others to rise to the challenge and see what they can do. Wasn't the greatest meeting for Team WRT, but they came out with the biggest prize of all. So for that, at least, they can be happy. Yes, absolutely. Uh, a, a win and then a seventh and then two retirements. We can now hear from Laurence Van Thor and Robin Freitz. They were John. Robin Freitz, congratulations as a wheel. Perfect drive from both of you this afternoon. Yeah, it was a superb weekend. Team did a wonderful job. And, well, what can I ask more? Well, the pair of you are just controlling this championship, up, aside from Nagaro, we'll not go there, but you've just been dominant. Yeah, I mean, uh, we know each other for years. Everybody knows that. and. It's a brilliant team, we have a good car, so there's nothing that go go wrong. Well, he did a great job, handed you the car, you had a new set of rubber, and really it was a bit of a drive in the sun this afternoon, wasn't it? Uh, it was more than that, but uh, it's true, he gave me the car in the perfect position where I only could, could wish for. I was joking in front of the race, like, give me the car with 10 seconds of hands, and I'm happy, that's what he did. So, no, it was a really good weekend, especially because we're home. Uh, it's important for us, for the Belgium, for the WRT. 
so it makes it, uh, makes it special. Robin, when you saw the 3-3-3 Ferrari go out of the first corner, did that make your life potentially any easier? Uh, at the beginning I didn't know because at the start the Bentley just uh, came on, on the left of me and he was a bit quick on the straight so I closed him but I didn't see the Ferrari. I heard something but after the second corner my engineer told me the Ferrari is off and yeah, I had a little gap from BMW so it was a good start. Well congratulations once again and go and enjoy it. Thank you. I believe that's the WRT Audi's first victory here in uh, this series as well, in, in, as far as the main race is concerned. So now let's hear from our second place men, Maximilian Buk and Vance on Abril. There were John. Vance on Abril, Max Buk, second place for Bentley. But I have to ask you, Vance, so turn one, contact with Ferrari, was it avoidable? In the situation that it was at the first corner, no, it wasn't. Um, I think it's a bit 50-50, you know, I had a, a good start, I had a good run on fringe and I was going for the inside and he blocked me very late. So I was in the dust and breaking a lot in the ABS and it was very difficult. So first of all, I think this block was also 50-50, I did not like that too much and I had to break, he braked a bit early as well, so that made Siegfried or Siedler in the car. Um, I had to add contact with him because I had nowhere to go, so, and also he turned it pretty early as well to try to cut on French. So this is a racing incident, I mean, you know, of course I'm, I'm sorry for them, it's not the way I race and it's not like how I like to be raced, but these things happen, you know, we had, uh, Maxi had a, a contact in uh, Nogaro in the first race, and nothing, you know, it's 50-50, it was a racing incident, and uh, this time it was it was complicated, it was the first lap incident, but yeah, I mean, we, we had a good... Listen, listen, I think Vance has answered all the questions I was going to ask you, but you had a lovely drive to the end, clear air, second place. Yeah, uh, I had a pretty uh, solid stint uh, with the new tyres, I tried a bit to push in, in the beginning to clear off the BMW. Uh, I think today we have been the lucky ones also with the number two, with the drive through 50-50 situation at the start. Uh, I think we have been the lucky ones today and I think uh, I'm pretty happy with P2 and uh, we had a mega car, mega team, uh, mega pit stop, all good. Well done guys, congratulations. Here's a look at the results after 39 laps of racing in the main race here at Zolda. Victory for Robin Freitz and Laurence Van Thor. 10 seconds clear of Vance on Abril and Maximilian Buk in second place. Then the two Brazilian BMWs, Attila Abreu and Valdena Brito, followed by Cacabueno and Sergio Jimenez, which moves Abreu and Brito up into second in the championship standings. Nicky Bermanov and Marcus Vingelhock, a good result for them uh, in fifth position. They'll be more than happy with that, I'd have thought, after a difficult start to the year. Down in 13th place then was the GT Russian team of Alexei Karachev and Bernd Schneider, the last of our runners, as Christopher Meese and Enzo E, Kevin Esther and Rob Bell, and Marco Seyfried and Norbert Siedler all retired from the race. Podium procedures about to get underway. But here's a look at the championship standings. Freitz and Van Thor now have a very big lead over Ortelli and Raquelmi, who are second in the championship standings at the moment. And that really is a big advantage, isn't it? It's uh, 39 points over uh, Stefan Ortelli. Norbert Siedler is in fourth position. Uh, Rob Bell and Kevin Esther in fifth. No points for them, but it really is advantage. Freitz and Van Thor as far as the championship is concerned. And then further down, you can see Vance on Abril picking up his first points of the season there in 10th uh, position. And, uh, oh, this is the this is the Blancpain overall GT Series. My apologies, that's why I was getting a little bit confused. But, uh, yeah, nevertheless, overall in the GT Series, they have a really strong advantage at the top of the championship after performing well in both the uh, sprint and the endurance races so far this season. So now we wait for the podium presentation to get underway and it's Robin Freitz and Lawrence Van Thor for the fourth time in a row who are on the top step in the Blancpain Sprint Series. Vance on Abril and Maximilian Buch finish in second. The first time they've managed to get a strong performance out of their Bentley and I really think if they'd have got second place at the start of the race instead of punting off the Ferrari they could have been there or thereabouts for the whole of the race. And third place for Valdeno Brito and uh, Attila Abreu. A really strong performance from the Brazilians once again who are having a great season. But here in Belgium it's going to be the Belgian national anthem 
<laughs> the Brazilians are happy whenever they finish on the podium. There you can see the Silver Cup winners, Tom Dillman and Jules Simkoviak over on the left-hand side. The Pro-Am winners, Bernd Schneider and Alexei Karachev are about to climb onto the podium too. Very busy podium up there. There's Karachev on the left, Bernd Schneider appears now. And a congratulations with the Brazilian squad. And now the Belgian national anthem in Zolder. Delight in Belgium for the Belgian Audi Club, the top step of the podium in their home race. Next we move to the home race of the GT Russian squad, a street circuit around the university at Moscow. But there is Jacques Heinen, the president of the board at the circuit, Zolder, handing out the trophies to our race winners, Laurence Van Thor and Robin Freitz. Top step of the podium and they extend their championship lead. Vincent Abril and Maximilian Buch handed their trophies by Hugo Leroy, president of the General Assembly here at the circuit, Zolder, which has been a regular on the Blanc Pan calendar for a number of years now. And Jean-Paul Puskins handing over the trophies to the third place pairing of Valdino Brito and Attila Abreu. And that means it's uh, three podiums in their four races so far this season. Consistency for them. And for that 77 car as well, it's, uh, they've only had one race so far this year where that number 77 car hasn't been on the podium. And uh, that was the qualifying race yesterday. But Lambrex, the administrator of the circuit, Zolder handing out the trophies to our Silver Cup winners, Jules Simkoviak and Tom Dillman. The Fjordback brothers finishing second in that class, some six places further back. And now here comes Stefan Rattel with the cash, handing over the... 30,000 euros to Lawrence Van Thor and Robin Freitz and the WRT club. 20,000 for Buk and Abril. And 10,000 for Valdino Brito and Attila Abreu. Silver Cup prize money as well. 20,000 for Simkoviak and Dillman. And uh, Pro-Am's taking their money to Bernd Schneider and uh, Alexei Karachev who finished down in 13th place but Schneider had the pace to try and get past Sanders Fjord back only four tenths of a second apart at the line but a very busy podium at the end of the Blancpain Sprint Series event here in Zolder a great weekend of racing and we now look forward to the rest of the season to Moscow, to the Algarve, to Misano and to Zandvoort as the champagne is sprayed it's victory for Belgian Audi Club in Belgium and it's the top step for Robin Freitz and local man Laurence Van Thor. A really strong performance as they extend their championship advantage as we leave Belgium. Let's have a look back at the highlights of our main race here in Zolder. It was Freitz and Van Thor who started on pole position, but coming down into turn one, there was contact. The Bentley going into the Ferrari. It does look pretty 50-50 to me. It sort of does, but my eyes were drawn to the number three Audi making it's number two Audi making its move up by the far wall, and of course ramifications for that later in the race. A replay, a, a replay of the replay, if you will, <laughs> and the green Ferrari hopes sinking with every second. And that was where the 77 BMW of Valdena Brito and Attila Abreu got their advantage. They started fifth. Look at the yellow BMW here on the left-hand side started fifth then before they knew it they were in second place a great uh, start to the race for them as it got very busy coming down into turn four Nicky Mayer Melrov made a good start as well and they would go on to finish in fifth position 
Very busy further back, the Nissan pushed across the chicane. They could only recover the 10th place, not the best of days for Dolby. And uh, oh, there was uh, all sorts of carnage going on for Stefano Telli being pushed off down at the chicane. But he then got on a bit of a charge and made his way past the 55 car of uh, Kevin Estra, who had to retire in the early stages. And it was an unhappy Marco Seafried. You don't think of German drivers gesticulating a lot, but certainly there was plenty of gesticulation for, from Paul Marco. He went to see the Bentley team on the pit wall, but then calmed down. But his race absolutely over. Very busy in the pit stops and BMW were super quick. Yeah, they did uh, They did a very good job there. But the Bentley team were able to get Book and Abril out in second position. And uh, Christopher Meese was then later handed a drive through penalty. It was a slow stop for the second Bentley car, though. Uh, there, Enzo Ede ended up in the gravel trap. Not quite sure how, but well, uh, it but was a bad day for the number two car. It was. We wondered if he'd been uh, doing something with the transponder. There'd been a message on the screen, but uh, the team said it was just a spin. And I think Enzo's body language told you all he needed to know. We had a great battle for 11th in the closing stages. The 74 car of Anders Fjordback trying to hold on to that 11th spot. But finally, Philip Vlasic forced him into a mistake. They went side by side down towards turn one. Vlasic a little bit late on the brakes. Anders Fjordback tried to get back wasn't quite able to and it was an 11th place finish at the end for Philip Vlasic but up at the front it was Lawrence Van Thor and Robin Freitz who took victory in Zolder their first victory here in Zolder and their fourth in a row in the championship they extend their advantage at the top can they continue it in Moscow see you then